a recipient of a very prestigious fellowship from Indian Academy of Pediatric Anesthesia, and he has a good academic contribution in various professional societies. Over to Dr. Ras Tobin and Dr. Navdeep Sethi, sir. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, uh, Rakesh, for this uh, your very kind words. Thank you so much. Um, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Rakesh Garg as the next speaker. He is professor of anesthesiology at the very prestigious All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He is a great fraternity friend to have. I, I do call him quite often when I have research related queries because you know he seems to have all the answers for me. Um, his area of, area of interest is onchoanesthesia. Uh, many, of, many of you probably don't know that he's uh, already uh, on his way to publish the first, very first book along with Dr. Bhatnagar on onchoanesthesia. Uh, other interest areas is pain management, airway and research. Uh, he has more than 250 publications to his name. Um, he's also uh, uh, an editor for Indian Journal of, uh, an, uh, an associate editor, and, and he has contributed uh, in the editorial board of uh, 12 international and national journals. Uh, his uh, contribution um, for academic advancement is well known. Uh, I'm sure many of you are aware that uh, apart from research, he has also been a major um, contributor for establishing the Indian uh, um, guidelines for CPR and for which very rightly he has been recognized by the Indian Society of Anesthesiology with ISA President's Award in 2015 and 2017. Uh, I will hand over now to Major General Navdeep Sethi uh, to introduce the topic uh, which Dr. Garg is going to be presenting. Dr. Sethi to you. <clears throat> Hello, Dr. Sethi. I think he has joined, but some audio problem, I think. So your mic is not on. Sethi says your mic. Yes. Uh, am I audible now, ma'am? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, today, Dr. Garg will be bringing his immense expertise to bear on a very important topic, namely periprocedural consideration in anesthesia for radiotherapy and oncological interventions. These topics include uh, external beam radiation or teletherapy, internal beam radiation, therapy, and various procedures, chemo ports, IV access, interventional radiology, diagnostic endoscopies. I'm sure uh, there's just to name just a few. And uh, I'm quite confident that these procedures in adults and in children will both be dealt very expertly by Dr. Gart. So without further ado, I hand over the mic to Dr. Rakesh Gart. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, sir, for the kind introduction. So I'll be talking on this topic, uh, greetings from All India Institute of Medical Sciences. So when we talk of uh, the anesthesiologist role, <clears throat> as uh, Dr. Naveen mentioned, and the subsequent speakers will also highlight, that anesthesiologist, anesthesiologist role is expanding outside the operating rooms in various uh, format. And it's just not the number and the places where the procedures are being done, but various complex procedures are also being done outside the operating room, and that creates a lot of challenges. When you talk of the cancer patients, uh, this is a multimodal management, and radiotherapy remains one of the aspects of the multimodal management for cancer patient management. And almost two-thirds of these patients would require radiation therapy at some point of their stays, maybe pre-surgical or post-surgical. And these radiation therapy are probably from three intent. It could be a radical RT, which is probably for the cure of the disease, or a palliative radiation therapy, which is probably for the uh, temporary improvement of the symptoms and maybe life prolongation by taking care of the symptomatology. And specifically in certain things, like for example, say metastatic cancer to the uh, vertebra le leading to neurological symptoms or maybe to the brain metastasis, symptomatic radiation therapy is being provided. Now, when we talk of as anesthesiologist, where are we required for radiation therapy, uh, especially in a pediatric population, it may be for the CT scanning or CT simulation. It could also be because of the RT session, these patients which require repeatedly 
brachytherapy, as Dr. Sethi was mentioning. And there are a lot of procedures for oncology, like, for example, biopsies, uh, insertion of various venous accesses, and interventions as well, which requires. So, okay, I will be just focusing on the uh, radiotherapy and one of the important interventions which is done for cancer. Now, when we talk of radiotherapy, there are various machines that are being used, linear accelerator machine, uh, which Rajesh. delivers high energy. Rakesh, I'm muting everybody. You please unmute yourself. Right, sir. Please unmute yourself. So uh, these therapies are usually divided, uh, are being provided into uh, various fractions because we want to reduce the side effects. That's why they are divided into 15 to 30 fractions to deliver the total dose so that the curative intent for providing this radiation for the cure of cancer is taken care of. Simultaneously by fractionating them, the side effects are reduced in these patients. And usually if you see the uh, flow of a patient when he is being planned for radiation therapy, usually the patient is having some CT planning wherein uh, the, the tumor site is marked for it. The, the machine is inclined in such a way that the radiation is focused on a particular tumor site, not affecting the normal tissues. And then subsequently patient uh, receives repeated therapies, maybe 15, 30 sessions, depending upon the type of cancer or depending upon the uh, site of cancer. Now, the concerns for anesthesiologists in these are usually, majority of them will be a short procedures. They are painless, but they require complete immobility because the movement of a patient during radiation therapy can lead to the uh, exposure of radiation to a normal area and not to a tissue, uh, tumorous area. And that's why the effect may come down and the side effects may increase. And that's why a planning or simulation session is undertaken in which um, a plaster immobilization cast is created, a mold is created, so that the patient gets a right exposure to the right place without damaging the normal tissues. This initial session where the planning has been done, it may take a little longer time, maybe sometimes half an hour or maybe 45 minutes, even an hour or so. But subsequent sessions are usually uh, small sessions, usually not more than five to 10 minutes. Now challenges for radiation therapy, which is one of the outside operating room anesthetic management is with regards to many things. It is regards to a new place. It's with regard to the staff because we are not interacting with the anesthesiologist and the trained anesthesia technician here, but there are radio technicians, there are radiotherapists, there are physicists there. We need a backup, which is a little, little restricted, will come a little later. The patient related concerns and the equipment and other ancillary related concerns. Coming to the equipment challenges. Now, usually if you see the outside operating room areas, these areas are usually poorly equipped with deal of any kind of emergency. If everything is going fine, but if you need some emergency, like for example, say airway management, they may be lacking in the situation. And that is what the major issue is. If you look at our operating room, they are well equipped. We have the latest sophisticated equipments. We have everything available to us. But if you go outside the operating room uh, procedures at various places, probably a older machine, a dumped machine from the operating room will be, using, will be used for these procedures. And uh, they may not be having a proper monitoring system. They may not be having proper lines or oxygen supply for these patients. So everything is a makeshift when we go for outside operating room. But at this point, we need to take some uh, decision that these things are equally required. In fact, more required outside the operating room. And we have to insist on that even for these procedures like radiation therapy or planning, we need to have a well-equipped sector wherein just not anesthesia workstation, but also various monitoring systems must always be there. And this is not just the uh, availability of these things, the teaching and training and the availability of the equipments go, sim uh, go simultaneously because we'll be interacting with a person who are not well trained as an anesthesiologist or as an assistant to an anesthesiologist. So there will be a lot of issues. How we ask laryngoscope, they will give endoscope. And that is the uh, in an emergency situation <clears throat> that will be a big issue. So that also needs to be taken care of. <clears throat> so this is what our uh, uh, procedures where we do outside the operating room, they need to be equipped and we need to insist our authorities that everything needs to be there because these patients can have urgencies and emergencies and that's why we need to have a well-equipped place so that these patients can be managed easily. We need to have all the equipments which are required for emergency management, including a difficult airway cart, a difficult emergency crash cart, the resuscitation cart should also be there for these patients. So to summarize, when we say that uh, we are providing the, the anesthesia uh, in a radiotherapy suit, these are the mnemonic that we can remember of, which is uh, included the suction, the availability of oxygen, 
appropriate airway gadgets, depending upon the type of patients that you're managing for radiation exposure, the drugs, the monitoring system, and the equipments that are required for such procedures. With regards to staff, yes, we need to you know, train them. The special problems in these patients could be uh, because they are not well trained. Maybe we want uh, in a COVID area. If a patient is saturated, I need a mask with an AMBU, but here what they provide to us. So this means we need to train the ancillary staff, which are part of uh, radiation therapy suit, who are technologies physicists there, that they can also help us in case the emergency arises. So we need to train them so that they become more familiar. A basic expertise needs to be given to them so that they can understand. And a regular checkup of all those inventories needs to be ensured because they are not well-versed for anesthesia-related things. Our trained anesthesiologists should provide anesthesia in the remote locations because the complexity of procedures are increasing. And that's why our trained anesthesiologist is mandatory for managing these patients outside the operating room for radiotherapy. The staff needs to be trained and that's responsibility should be with the lead anesthesiologist and that regular training and checking of the inventory is very, very essential. Also a good communication system needs to be developed because when we are working with other specialty, as we do our, with our surgical colleagues by discussing the surgical plan, same discussion should also be there with radiation oncologists that what plan they are going to do, how much time it is going to take and the patient assessment as well. Identify an assistant to help you in case if it arises and check for the consent also. It is very, very essential that whenever we receive and call that some patients are posted for radiation therapy, we need to think and plan. We also need to anticipate problems based on our assessment of the patient that what patient positioning will be required, how much time will it take, what are the areas with tumor is being involved, whether the patient can lie supine or not, and so on and so forth. So all those uh, problems need to be anticipated based on the patient assessment, and then we can always look for a backup help in case it requires. Coming to the procedural challenges, uh, radiation therapy for adults, they can lie uh, in this radiation suit and probably they do not require any type of anesthesia, but children often require some type of anesthesia or maybe sedation at times, yes, anesthesia is also required. These are the repeated procedures. Usually they are done five days a week with the off on Sunday, and then they're repeated from 15 to 30 sections as this is being planned for. As I mentioned earlier, the initial planning, the first planning may take a linger longer time. Patient needs to be totally immobile, and hence we need to provide some type of anesthesia to these patients. The other challenge remains monitoring for these patients because while the radiation therapy is being delivered, we have to monitor from, a, from these patients from a distance. And this is, that is why we require slave monitors for monitoring the various uh, monitoring, including pulse oximeter or, or uh, the heart rate. And also patient needs to be monitored. And that's why usually there's a CCTV camera with a camera with a screen focused outside the radiation suit where we can observe these patients. Even though CCTV is there at times, these patients are inaccessible during the radiation because they need to focus it, it becomes dark. There's a pure illumination. And that's why it requires a great vigilance and expertise for managing these patients so that we can early detect any unexpected events. With regards to patient, as I mentioned, it's a pediatric age group. They become a real challenge with regards to various options. These patients may have comorbidities which may be related to the cancer per se, or patient who has received any type of previous therapies, maybe surgery, maybe chemotherapy, or even with repeated radiation therapy, after around two to three weeks, they can develop radiation therapy, radiation induced side effects, which also needs to be looked for. Patients require repeated procedures, so we have to repeat the anesthesia and sedation repeatedly uh, 15 to 30 times in a month. Venous cannulation becomes an issue because always we require some type of uh, administration for drugs. That's why a venous cannulation for a longer duration in a children becomes a major issue. It gets thrombos, when it gets thrombos, child can take it out, it becomes a source of infection. The selection of drug is important and the fasting status also needs to be taken care of because these patients are coming almost daily in the morning hours and that's why the fasting status needs to be ensured. We also need to look for issues with the cancer per se, especially when these patients are posted for radiation to the head and neck and chest areas. Patient may have symptoms due to disease and hence it should be considered when we are looking for a strategy for anesthetic technique or management. Regarding anesthetic technique, techniques vary from no anesthesia to minimal or deep sedation and even general anesthesia. And it depends upon the patient's age and its acceptability, patient's medical condition, desired level of anesthesia, procedure to be formed and duration of the procedure. 
The monitoring should minimally involve pulse, pulse oximetry and capnography minimally, but yes, NIBP and ECG is also required at times. When the patient is being received, uh, receiving the radiation exposure, the CCTV should also focus, they should be zoomed uh, in and out so that we can focus on the chest so that the respiratory movements can be looked for and we can clinically pick up the signs for respiratory obstruction in these patients. Regarding the choice of drugs, there are various drugs which, needs, which can be selected, but usually we need to have a drug which is uh, uh, safer in these. If you are looking for sedation and analgesia, let's have a drug which is uh, uh, you know, rapid acting, shorter acting, uh, the failure rates are a little uh, slower, but then these are sedation analgesia sometimes when we push, want patient to be immobile, they can have issues with the airway and respiratory depression, and that's why sometimes it becomes challenging. So we have to maintain a, uh, maintain a tight balance between uh, the degree of safety in conscious sedation versus deep sedation in these patients, and that's why sometimes we need to proceed towards general anesthesia so that these patients can be safely uh, get these procedures done without having any events. The titration and adjustment of doses of these sedation, uh, sedative agents requires skill and experience because uh, we are not near to the patient during this. The repeated doses can lead to uh, some type of uh, uh, events that needs to be monitored for. A continuous infusion can lead to respiratory obstruction or hemodynamic uh, changes. That's why uh, the, the use of these drugs becomes much more challenging. The, out of the various drugs that are available in our armamentarium includes midazolam, fentanyl, propofol, ketamine, ketofol, ramifentanyl, and pyalox. Ramifentanyl is a good drug, but it's not available in India. So majority of time people are using propofol for titrating it. And yes, if there is no contraindication, a combination of ketamine with propofol is also an option. With the emergence of dexmetomidine, it is emerging and an, as an, a very uh, good agent because it maintains uh, the respiratory efforts. The chances of depressions are not there. The side effects are not much, but uh, not many studies are available for pediatric patients. We should also be aware for non-pharmacological techniques because I said it's a different place. So having uh, tattoos uh, or, or some like tattoos on the, on the uh, radiotherapy suit itself makes the patient, makes the child more comfortable and acceptable. Even the roof can be made like a sky with some stars, so patient accepts is much better. Airway management remains an issue. If you see in this diagram, they can be supine with this mold up, or they sometimes need to be posted in the uh, supine on, in the prone position also. So when they are put in a supine position with a, with a head mold, we can uh, apply the oxygen by face mask and that will help the patient to get oxygenation. But sometimes uh, these patients will require some type of support to the chest, which is provided by this mold. So when you are applying this mold, be cautious that the, ch the child mandible is not being pushed back, leading to airway obstruction, and that should be maintained as patent when the, any type of sedation is being given to these patients. When these patients are kept prone like this, the oxygen tubing alone is used instead of a face mask. Maybe you can use at times the nasal prongs also, so the oxygenation can be maintained. And remember that when this mask or a nasal prong is being attached, usually we attach a capnography tubing along it so that we can see the patient's respiratory rate and uh, uh, ensure that the patient is uh, having some, uh, the patient is not having obstruction as such. The airway equipments, the need depends upon the uh, patient's uh, uh, assessment and these equipments must be available when you're getting these procedures done. Documentation is very, very important because not only these patients are being done repeatedly, but then uh, the, the doses is sometimes can vary. So uh, if we have a documentation from a day one to day two, we know that these patients require this much dose so that we are not underdosing and overdosing to these patients. So that not only the side effects, but an optimal environment for radiation therapy is being delivered to these patients. So that's why we need to maintain a, a, a well-documented chart for these patients so that subsequent they can be provided good care. Post-procedure care, once they have received the radiation therapy, they are shifted to a recovery room Monitors are attached to the patient's recovered. The oxygen is supplemented. And at times, it depends upon if a patient is, uh, is uh, very sick or requires some type of airway management, they may be required care in uh, some intensive care unit. The discharge criteria are standard. Once the patient is arousable, they have a protective reflexes. And as according to the patient's age appropriate, patient can sit up, patient can have something to drink, and then they can be allowed for, for discharge. Usually they have to come daily and that's why the fasting and early feeding is taken care of. We need to remember that the radiation therapy is a repeated procedure. So these patients in immediate uh, 
when they are being repeatedly getting RT, they can have some side effects that also needs to be taken care of. At times they can have mucositis and pain. That's why they may require analgesic administration. So that also needs to be taken care of. A couple of slides on uh, another procedure where local chemotherapy treatment, which is called as transcatheter arterial chemoembolization or hepatic artery infusional chemotherapy. This is a procedure usually done for liver cancer where the delivery, the aim is to deliver high dose of chemotherapy directly at the tumor site through our arterial cannulation uh, catheter and through which the chemotherapy is injected into the tumorous site by having effect directly on the tumor and with having minimal side effect uh, uh, on the other system. For this, usually general anesthesia is required because it's a long procedure, usually can take half an hour to two hours, and that's why uh, general anesthesia is required for these patients. But we also need to be looking for the various complications. Sometimes there could be bleeding, there could be embolism, there could be abscess. So these all things need to be looked for when these procedures are being done, and that's why they require intensive monitoring in the post-operative period. The other issue is because a lot of radiation exposure is being done for these patients, so we should follow the normal norms of radiation protection, the time, distance, and shielding. So that three basic principles needs to be taken care of for protecting the healthcare worker from the radiation which is being uh, uh, released during these procedures, either in the radiotherapy or over the interventional procedure. That needs to be looked for. So to conclude, when we are talking for anesthesia at the remote locations, we need to think of in terms of its applicability, ability for the anesthetist to manage it, the affordability, that is the, the availability of sufficient equipments, the affability, the desire of doctor to have anesthetist services. So we should have a proper team there and we need to take accountability so that we can provide safe care outside the operating room also. And it's a devotion to humanity or selfishness that we are providing care at many places in the hospital as anesthesiologists and we should be proud of it. That's why we should be very, very careful for arranging our things so that we can provide safe care, not only into the operating room, but also equally safe care outside the operating room. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, that was an excellent presentation, uh, Dr. Garg, and uh, very well brought out. Uh, a very important point which you made was that in some places we don't have good anesthesia equipment. And it's extremely important to have good equipment because as we know, the radiation equipment, CT, MRI, they cost crores. But adding good anesthesia equipment would only mean a few more lakhs. Fortunately now, in good institutions, we are having on a turnkey basis, anesthesia equipment and oxygen pipelines also being provided. Excellent talk. That's true, sir. Uh, I'm looking at the questions. Uh, okay, uh, we don't uh, seem to have uh, too many questions, but I'd just like to ask you one thing, Dr. Uh, Garg, you know, and that is uh, the use of Dexmed. Uh, if we use only Dexmed with a little bit of propofol, uh, what is our experience with that? I think this seems like a very good combination for children undergoing brachytherapy. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, we have started using dexmedomidine in a couple of cases. Uh, we have used, uh, conducted one study as our uh, uh, DM thesis here using nasal dexmedomidine also for these patients, which are well acceptable, except it's caused a little bit of stingness, but otherwise it was well acceptable in these group of patients. The intravenous dexmedomidine is quite safe. We have used in a couple of patients and found it very effective, especially it has some analgesic action and when subsequent radiation with some pain because of mucositis, it will take care of both. With the gas to the propofol, it has been a traditional and conventional drug which is uh, found to be being used. Uh, we don't, we not have used the combination of both the infusions, propofol and dexmedomidine uh, for our patients, but both the drugs has been used independently with good outcome. So I think dexmedomidine will be one of the very promising agents for these procedures subsequently with some of its uh, uh, analgesic action without having any respiratory depression effect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Raj Tobin, ma'am, would you like to uh, say something? Uh, if not, uh, uh, is ma'am with us? Ma'am ma Raj Tobin? Okay. Uh, if not, uh, then I, I think uh, we can uh, bring this talk to an end over here, Dr. Rakeshkar. And congratulations once again for an excellent presentation.
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, sir, Dr. Sethi. Uh, Dr. Tobin, uh, ma'am, you, uh, you are muted. You need to unmute yourself. She's saying Okay. Something. Yes, we must listen to ma'am. Yes, please. You need to unmute, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Tobin, ma'am, you're you are muted one. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, ma'am. We can hear you now, ma'am. No, it's absolutely wonderful presentation, Rakesh, and uh, good coming from you because this is your your field. This is the area you kind of excel in. Uh, yeah, highest number of cases, I think, uh, amongst the institutions which do these uh, cases in adults or children. Um, and it, it's a very comprehensive uh, presentation. And I like the question put by Navdi because all of us are now going very fond of um, uh, decks, you know, because we kind of, we, we just love it during during the surgery, during extubation for all these uh, sedation cases. Um, it's, it's like a blessing to us, propofol and dex combination. Uh, and I think a lot of us are using that, and quite a few of us, uh, whether children or adult. And, um, and of course, the precautionary things he mentioned, because many people forget about the radiation exposure, which is, you know, it has to be emphasized um, also for the for the healthcare professionals who are going in and absolutely wonderful presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you Thank so you. much. And I uh, sincerely thanks uh, our chairperson, Dr. Raj Tobin and uh, Mrs. General Dr. Navdeep Sethi for sharing and spending the time. Thank you for your valuable words. So may I have the pleasure to invite our next chairperson, Dr. Jashree Shud. Madam is chairperson of Institute of Anesthesiology, Pain and Perioperative Medicine at Sir Gangaram Hospital. She is joint secretary of board of management at Sir Gangaram Hospital. She is a member of specialist board in anesthesia at a prestigious national board of examination. He has numerous publications and she has edited two books as well related to anesthesia. She has been awarded IMA Medical Healthcare Excellence Award. She is a fellowship coordinator of WFSA sponsored thoracic anesthesia. She has been awarded Atal Swasthya Bhushan Samman 2019. She is also a Best Teacher Award. She's also received a Long Service Award 2018 and Best Academician Award from Sadangaram Hospital Trust. She is a founder member and trustee and CEO of Indian College of Anesthesiologists. And she has many, many big uh, achievements. And she is one of the very popular speaker, chairperson, clinician, researcher, and academician. Welcome, ma'am. Thank we you. We also have with, welcome, ma'am. So we also have uh, Dr. Sunil Sethi with us. He is consultant anesthesiologist at Virk Hospital, Karna. He is uh, president ISA Haryana and past secretary ISA Haryana. He has done a wonderful uh, conference in 2019 as organizing secretary at ISA Haryana. And he is a uh, uh, honorary treasurer for our Research Society of Anesthesiology and Clinical Pharmacology, and is a very popular clinician and academician. Welcome, uh, Dr. Sunil Sethi, sir. Over to you, ma'am and sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. After the two very interesting talks, uh, we now go on to the third very important talk and a very interesting one, which is on peri-procedural anesthetic considerations for GI endoscopic procedures. Such an important topic. All these are nowadays the hot topics where the anesthesiologists are actually called to provide anesthesia. And uh, it's always the, uh, you know, the gastroenterologists and all who think it's all very simple and very easy by giving just a full set themselves. But now they've come to know it's much more than that. And they have realized that the anesthesiologist is so important for their procedures. And for this, uh, lecture, we have a very, very uh, eminent speaker. She speaks so well. And uh, Sunil, would you like to introduce her? Although I would have loved to introduce her, but would you like to introduce her? Is Sunil there? Dr. Sunil? I didn't see his name there. Uh, Adam, you please it, go ahead, ma'am. Okay, so that's it. So I have the pleasure of uh, introducing Sangeeta Khanna. I always call her Sangeeta. Uh, she is the director of anesthesia at Medanta, the Medicity. And uh, uh, she's a, got a keen interest in renal transport, robotic surgery, as well as thoracic anesthesia. She has several publications, national and international. She has been the organizing secretary and the past president of ISA Haryana. And uh, she is the DNB coordinator, the GCI, and the NABH quality no, champion of the institute. 
So, uh, Sangeeta, we are all very keen to hear your talk. Welcome. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that generous, generous introduction. I'm just trying to share my screen and presentation. I think there's some um, issue coming up with that. Your Let video me... is also off, madam. Uh, video to start, career, Dr. Naveen. But uh, screen share, can you mean that? Screen share. Screen share, can you mean that? Screen share, can you mean that? Screen share, can Screen will, go away, screen will go away, ma'am. Just uh, make it full screen and see. Uh, we'll just uh, confirm from here if it is coming here with us. Okay. Can you see the th uh, presentation? No, not yet, ma'am. Not yet, ma'am. Application. On share screen, are you able to uh, see your the, desktop uh, screen, ma'am? Yes, I can see the desktop screen and I can see you also. But when uh, you share karo to share ka jo option, option hai, wo highlight in your Can you just uh, log out and log in? Green ma color ka niche hai. Main us green color ka niche hai. Move one second. It's coming, ma'am. It's coming. Your email yeah, yeah. is coming. Yeah. 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 Okay. Can you see it? Can you see? And we can see your email. Can you just open your PowerPoint presentation now and uh, open it up, ma'am? Your email uh, is email is coming up on the screen, ma'am. Stop sharing. Okay, I'm doing share your entire screen, okay? Yeah, perfect, ma'am. That's also yeah, and then when I'm clicking on your entire screen, it is not allowing me to share. They have to give you permission. So just open your PPT, ma'am, and just keep it open on your desktop and then it's open. Uh, the PPT no, is open. No, no, okay, no. I'll open it on my desktop and keep it right. Hmm. It's open on my desktop. Now now share the screen, ma'am. Can you share the screen now? It doesn't give me a chance to share the screen. Can I mail it to you? Sure, ma'am. You can mail it to me. Uh, I'll yes. uh, share from here, ma'am, and you can speak. Yeah. My email is dwrgar, uh, Dr. Argarg at hotmail.com. Okay. I'm just sorry for this because it's just not. Uh... No, it's not, ma'am. Or if no you problem. want the no problem. to, uh, you know. No, you, just for, uh, you just email to him, uh, Sangeeta. Manji, ma'am. Rakesh. Uh, R. Gagna. Dr. R. Garg at hotmail.com, ma'am. Dr. R. Garg. Simultaneously, Rakesh, you can answer some questions in the chat box also. Uh, have you experienced, Dr. Indrani is asking, have you experienced tachyphylaxis with repeated anesthetics? I think this is an important question, and this is, uh, I just mentioned in one, uh, when we start giving the drugs to these patients, the tachyphylaxis has been seen, especially when we see, uh, for example, the propofol, propofol based anesthesia, it has been seen. Uh, there is no robust evidence, but yes, the requirement of propofol with the duration of uh, RT fractions, it slightly increases subsequently. This is one aspect. And second aspect is with regards to the analgesic. As I mentioned, uh, when a patient is getting repeatedly RT, uh, especially to the head and neck area or the thoracic area, there is some amount of inflammation because of the RT side effect. They can be a mucositis. And because of this, patient's requirement of the anesthetic agents also increases. And there is some amount of catabolic phase, which also uh, leads to the increase of the 
uh, requirement of these drugs in the uh, uh, subsequent radiation therapy. So that needs to be taken care of. And that is why we need to mention in our documentation that we have used this agent and this much is the requirement for this RT session. So that subsequent we know that the patient's increase is approximately this much and we can titrate our agents accordingly. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. And yes, you please download the email attachment at the same time. You've answered that question in chat box that for Dexmed, uh, if we are using for MRI suits on the radiological suits, can we use it as an infusion of uh, IV line or as an infusion pump? So if MRI compatible infusion pumps are available, we can use those. Mm -hmm. And otherwise we can use for as an infusion. Madam, attachment is not there. Can you just resend, ma'am? Dr. Sangeeta? Yeah. The attachment is not there in the email, ma'am. Forward, forward, you can find. I have sent it with the attachment. I'll send it again. Dr. Argarg at hotmail.com, no? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Your mail has been received with me, but attachment is not there. If the chairperson permits, can we go for the next session yeah. and come back to? Uh, yeah, till then I can, you know, just we can go to the next and then come back. I was just going to suggest that, Rakesh, let's have sure, the thanks. next one till sure. these things are all. Yeah, sure. Right, sure. No, you, no problem. No problem at all. It happens. Thank you. So may I have the privilege of uh, uh, inviting our next chairperson, uh, Dr. Rakesh Kumar, Professor Anesthesiology, Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences, SGT University, Gurgaon. He is the president of Airway Management Foundation, India. He has many publications and book chapters, more than 50 publications, three, uh, uh, four book chapters, uh, uh, 30 book chapters and four books. He has conducted numerous uh, workshops related to airway regarding to the uh, life resuscitation management, more than 500 workshops. He's a WHO fellow. He has been awarded with honor for meritorious services by Loknak Hospital, Government of Delhi. He's an international faculty for world airway management, uh, including various international forums. He has given orations at NITI Oration 2011 and Dr. Kamra Memorial Oration 2010. He uh, is the uh, director professor of anesthesiology at Morana Jat Medical College. He was the medical superintendent of emergency and ICU at Loknayak Hospital. Mm -hmm. He has headed the faculty of medical sciences anesthesiology. He is a training center coordinator for uh, uh, teaching various skills at Morana Jat Medical College. He is a well-renowned, uh, uh, not only a teacher to many of us, but a mentor and a very knowledgeable, full of knowledge uh, person. Uh, to all of us. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rakesh. Thank you, sir. Welcome, sir. May I also uh, request Dr. Indrani Hemant Kumar to join us as chairperson. She is professor and head of anesthesiology at State GS Medical College and KEM Hospital. She has more than three decades of experience in anesthesiology. She is the topper in uh, is uh, since her education and I, I know she is still a topper uh, with a lot of academic research and clinical uh, contributions. She has received the Harkovin Fellowship to train in cardiac anesthesiology at uh, Lake Valley Hospital, Pennsylvania. She has numerous publications and she has a special interest in obstetric, pediatric, cardiac and critical care. Welcome, ma'am. We also have a third chairperson with us, Dr. J.V. Divatia. She is professor and head at Tata Memorial Hospital. He is the past president of Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine and All India Difficult Airway Association. He is the past editor in chief of Indian Journal of Anesthesia. He has numerous publications, books, and chapters, and is a well renowned researcher, academician, and clinician. Welcome, Dr. Divatia, sir. Over to you, sir, chairpersons. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rakesh. And it's a pleasure to share the dais with. Uh, uh, our always lovely uh, Dr. Indra, Indrani and uh, our wonderful friend in Dr. Divetia. Um, I would like to know whether uh, I can introduce Lalit because I have worked with him a quite quite a lot. I want to hear from other chairpersons, please. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Okay. So, um, 
Lalit joined back uh, Maulana Azad Medical College after a, a stint in practice as well as in uh, a couple of other institutions. And uh, I had the I had the lovely uh, fortune that he joined our unit and worked with us. Uh, we worked together for a couple of years. And uh, as Dr. Rakesh has uh, told you all, uh, he's, he's a prolific writer. He has already written uh, a few books. And he's another prolific reviewer also, I think, with multiple journals around the country and the world. And he is on the editorial board of many, many of these. And uh, as I was talking to him in the morning, uh, uh, I realized that he has actually managed an MRI and CD center as a practitioner. And uh, having worked only three years in practice, I know that the, the kind of experience which you get in practice is, is, is something which is for, the, for your life uh, to carry on with. So I'm sure that uh, we we'll, we we'll learn a lot from him about this wonderful and very important area which uh, we all keep on doing. And I think already the previous speakers have mentioned the, the, the problems, the, the, the shortcomings, and what needs to be done in these uh, remote locations. So uh, I invite Dr. Lalit to uh, please uh, talk on anesthetic considerations for uh, radio therapy, uh, radiological procedures or imaging in children for CT and MRI. Lalit. Thank you, sir. Thank you, chairpersons, for giving me the opportunity for presenting a particular, a very important aspects of NORA, the anesthetic considerations for radiological imaging in children, especially for the CT and MRI. This is a very common topic because most of the persons have seen, uh, they have gone to the peripherals for the CT and MRI, and it is always a challenging to get a CT and MRI in a crying child. So that this topic is, as such, is very important because administration of sedation or anesthesia to a pediatric population Undergoing radiological procedure is always a part of NARA. Studies have shown that increased risk of airway-related adverse events, complications, even death outside the operating room location, especially in MRI and CT, are due to the remote touch with the patient. The most common event in adequate oxygenation ventilation, which are preventable with vigilant monitoring. Yes, it is an actual remote anesthesia because anesthetists are truly removed when providing care for radiological procedures, remote anesthesia locations, remote proximity from patient's airway, they may okay, occasionally view the patient from afar in a control room, but that makes it completely remote. Extreme importance of airway security, organizations of lines, monitor, providing effective and safe anesthetic, communication with radiologists and technologists is the key for such procedures. Whenever a patient or child come for the sedations for anesthesia for the CT or MRI procedure or other radiological, there are four aspects, the consent, the history, physical examination and preparation for the procedures. The consent is very important because childs are not of the legal age of giving the consent as well as they are having the, some hidden problems. So a proper consent and it has to be documented by the doctor as well as from standby, the staff nurse or the person from the center is very important. Similarly, the history part, there is always a risk of airway obstruction because of the child may have the large tongue, microgynethia, limited airway opening, excessive secretions, snorings, hydrocephaly, or he may be a normal child. But these airway things are always there, may be present. And NPO guidelines, yeah, 246 rule is always applied. Clear food, two hours, breast milk, four hours, and solid and formula for six hours. Older kids and our patients should be NPO after the midnight. However, in few children's chewing gum and candies, if they are very much crying, can be considered as clear fluids and can be given up to the two hours of the procedure. Coming to the physical examination of such pediatric population, breathing, evaluate the breath sounds, work of breathing to ensure respiratory status, if it is compromised or not, baseline oxygen saturation by pulse oximetry, baseline heart rate, heart sounds for any murmur, distal perfusions for any uh, sign of any shocks type emergencies, Examine other organs if the patient history suggests problem, potential problem like CNS systems and for their consciousness. There are some practical problems in such a source. Children cannot fully understand the medical necessity for testing the therapeutics, as well as they are very anxious seeing the large bulky machines and there is a sudden silence in those and suddenly they start crying and producing the loss of noise, which can heighten the discomfort. Patients, their parental, patient, physician satisfaction is ne not, never is found in the MRI source because they are very much attached to the child and they are very much anxious. 
they are crying they are removing their hands as well as the veins are very small so difficult iv cannulation is always there and expertise has to be there to do these cannulations and most important parents often hide the npo history of their child which are responsible for most of the complication related to the vomiting and aspiration in the post op area post procedural area so when a voluntary cooperation of the child is not practical sedation or general anesthesia should be provided to the same standards of care as would prevail in an operating theater mri room remember it is always made for the radiologist and never for the anesthesiologist because mri suits have been designed without the consideration for anesthetic needs such as pipelines gas suction they are never present and they are never of that standard which are required for the mri thus unit is very bulky with the little space around the machine the patient is often very far from the anesthesiologist access to the airway is limited iv line circuits tubing monitoring cables must be of the sufficient length to reach the patient deep within the scanner as well as these all things need some special considerations like patient positioning careful attention must be paid to extremely position like avoid stop cocks pressed into the patient body which may in, injure the patient St slack must be given to the iv lines they should be taped securely monitors if ga to be used tube extension to ensure slack and tight connections trial runs should be performed to ensure lines reach full extent of table movement if a rotating imaging arm is used as well in some neurological procedures a trial run should ensure no lines are caught and proximity to mri compatible machine is always to be seen more important in pediatric patient as it prevents the extra pressure because of the bulky lines bulky uh, uh, lines on the airway devices if they are used for ga coming to the spectrum of sedation which are used for such the radiological procedures we go from the minimal sedation to the general anesthesia in the minimal sedation while our patient responds appropri appropriately to the verbal commands the cognitive cognitive processing affected but no cardiopulmonary effects of the medicine is present while in the moderate patient respond to the verbal command or with addition of mild stimulation but uh, there may be need for maintain airway and ventilation which may or may not require intervention in the deep sedation you may require medical intervention to maintain the airway while in the general anesthesia there is always a need to maintain the airway and child is unable to be aroused with a verbal or painful stimuli so when your child is you are getting for the mri or ct they are assessing a sleeping infants for the level of sedation in the mri scanner is very difficult for example for a 2 month old child for the ct the sedation level is very minimal while if the same child 2 years becomes and he goes for the mri then the risk increases because you have to give the moderate sedation while if the child is 5 years suppose or it says 2 hours or 3 years but he needs a whole spine contrast mri with the brain angiography then you have to give the deeper deepest level of the sedation because it's a long procedure of around 1 and 1/2 hour and the child may wake up and once it is wake up you have to repeat most of the steps of the spines again and again so you need to maintain a level of sedation which is sometimes very difficult in the large procedures coming to the special consideration regarding monitoring pulse oximeter they should be non ferromagnetic with fiber optic signals ECG should be of high impedance graphite graphite electrodes and leads BP machine should have the oscillometers without non ferrous gauze CO2 analyzer should be side stream with long sampling line stellate should be copper model or hard plastic endotracheal tube spring with the cuff valve may distort the image so they can be wrapped up from the uh, uh, far from the imaging side or they can be uh, cut and uh, tied supraglottic airways again reinforced type cannot be used anesthesia workstation should be non magnetic machine aluminum cylinder should be there on the machine suction apparatus they should be wall mounted with at least 10 meter long tubing infusion pump not permitted into the mri suits extensions are needed however nowadays mri compatible infusion pumps are available coming to the ct lead sheet should be there because you may have to run any time for your child inside the sedation, uh, sedative area and defibrillator they are never permitted in the mri suits they can be kept out just outside the mri suit as and when required for their functioning so actually safety web where you have to see the which steps are more important including from the patient selection asa classifications airway evaluation a safe drug protocol screening of contraindications and the anesthetist should be uh, with the pulse it should be trained and there should be monitor better monitoring so coming to the anesthesia and sedation this is not a simple sedation like you can do give in the operating theater there is lots of lots of things which you have to look out and you have to manage them properly because there are lots of drug the most common drug which is used for the sedation everyone must have used during for the sedation is the pediclorel 
that is also known as the triclofos and it is one of the most safest drug to be used orally for sedation i have used it more than 5 years and i have never found any problem with this drug this is a phosphorylated derivative of chloral hydrate that is the ethanol derivative and it is converted to the trichloroethanol in the body which produces the sedation the doses varies from is from 1 month to 1 year the dose is 25 to 30 mg per kg however as the child grows up to the 5 year you can give to the 500 mg and from the 6 to 12 year although it is not practical to give more than 5 years but still it can be given 0.5 to 1 g in the uh, in the bigger child the effects are quite impredictable and the child do not sleep properly the advantage is that within 30 minutes of administration the child sleeps and it is well tolerated and effective non barbiturate type sleep promoting agent and it never provides the hangover or other side effects seen with the ga drugs second most commonly drug used for the sedation is midazolam it is a short acting anxiolytic sedative with the gaba receptor effect and it the dose is different it is the one of the very commonest drug which can be used by the every route from the iv to the im to the parrectal sublingual intranasal and iv infusion and uh, believe me you can use it in any way and always produce the effect if the child is 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 crying and he is not you are not able to put the cannula you can even give him some the oral midazolam and it works very well the dose is always differs with the age but the advantages are it is rapid in onset and no iv required if you are not able to put immediately however you should always secure an iv line once the child is bit sedated the disadvantage is that if the child is having some pain like for example the broken leg when you need to in ct or mri it doesn't provide the analgesia plus minus hypoxemia it is rarely seen but sometimes the paradoxical reactions of excitation is seen with the midazolam the third most important drug which one of everyone have used is ketamine it is a super anesthetic drugs which but uh, it causes the sedation analgesia and amnesia all three at a time however the problem is that it stimulates the salivary glands tracheal and bronchial secretion the dose like the midazolam is can be for the iv 1 to 2 mg for the sedations 0.5 to 2 mg for the analgesia 0.1 mg per kg intramuscular 2 to 5 and per oral as a liquid 6 to 10 mg per kg the advantages are many like it provides the potent analgesia sedation amnesia very hemodynamically stable and maintains the airway reflexes very well but the disadvantages at the same time are emergence phenomena childs are always uh, uh, they get up confused and they start crying and they start blabbering anything and their parents become very much anxious sometimes the recurrent regurgitations nausea and vomiting very much commonly seen and increased secretion which could be a pro- uh, potential risk if the child has the mild hidden uri the solution is being that ketamine should be used with the midazolam ondansetron and glycoparylate all these three drugs along with the ketamine mask the side effects of ketamine another very important drug is propofol it is a potent hypnotic drug with no analgesic property however the dose advantage that it is rapid in onset easily titrable antimatic and bronchodilator a bit of the disadvantage is that it has no analgesic property it is a very potent cardiopulmonary depressant is given in the largest doses sometimes causes the pain and the child start crying and may have the hiccups which may cause the bronchospasm and your whole purpose of sedation is lost and in a different over sedation is many times seen with the propofol the dose for the sedation being 1 to 2 mg per kg iv bolus then 50 to 200 microgram per kg per minute as per required the propofol is one of the drug which is used as given as the tiva for the some procedures which is commonly employed in many big centers in our nowadays dexmed a newer drug which is alpha 2 adrenergic agonist with mild analgesic properties the advantages is that it causes minimal respiratory depression and less delirium however no adequate and reliable amnesia and hypotension and bradycardia is seen in variety of the patient and up to 14% of the patient may have the bradycardia the dose of sedation is 1 microgram per kg over 10 minutes iv followed by maintenance dose of 0.5 to 0.1 microgram per kg per hour iv coming to the next ketofol this is the very properly drug very uh, important drug and it is most commonly used among the group of anesthesiologists in various places it is a mixture of the ketamine and propofol in the ratio of 1 is to 1 of ketamine uh, 10 mg per kg per ml is ketamine is made along with the propofol 10 mg per ml loaded in a syringe of 10 ml or 20 ml the two are kept in a single syringe the medial dose for this such of procedure is 0.75 mg per kg range being 0.2 to 2 and is shown to be very safe with less side effects of either drug the future drugs which is used in the advanced centers are the melatonin which causes the natural sleep may be induced successfully in 55% of the mri and 80% of the eeg as per the studies available and the dose is 2 to 10 mg orally and sometimes if the some centers have the uh, oral sucrose 
which provides analgesia up to the two month of the age, stimulates endogenous opioid and non-opioid pathways, and two ml may be administered effectively by oral syringe or as a pacifier and child sleeps well. Still, I would like to say that apart from these, the best sedation is the natural sleep. If the child is very sleep is very small and he is sleepy, or if you don't allow him to sleep and you feed him very well and you need not to give any type of sedation, the child sleeps like anything and you are able to get the short procedures without any sedation. Coming to the next, <coughs> sorry. Infusion schemes nowadays, TIVA is used in many centers where we have the infusion pumps, which are MRI compatible. They have the intravenous large extension line, which is attached to the MRI suits. And there are many cables, which works, which is attached to the computer. From computer, you can uh, maintain as per the requirements of the uh, monitoring, you can set up the rate. If one of the most common formula, which is used for sedation is the MAC for propofol infusion schemes which is given from three to 11 years of days in the various doses. This is very used nowadays in the bigger centers. And along with the Popofol, you can mix the ketamine, Dexmed, Midazolam in their usual uh, prescribed dose for the pediatric patients. So drugs are not the only things which you need. You also need the something that is the recovery or the emergency room. You need a proper care of the child once the sedation is done. And for this, you need a, a proper post op or post recovery mri compatible or say simple pulse oximeter oxygen cylinder and a stretcher which is having a movable type of stretcher where you can close the head up head up head down leg up whatever you required and an emergency card bag for that if you required any time any time you can run away with this bag and you can bring this to the ct or mri if you are not if, if anything happens to your child even if it is not sedated you need a full uh, array of the all the things which are read, uh, available as per the NORA protocols, which include the suctions, tubes, uh, various types of laryngoscopic blades, embu bags, and everything. And this is the minimum requirement which all the private practitioner, even in the big setups of the government hospital, should have in the minimum uh, requirement for a post op recovery room. So I am coming a few scenarios which I have uh, faced in my life uh, during my private practice. Ki how the child's and how will you decide what is the best sedation for a child? Starting from the first 11 month old fell, a child fell from the couch on the tile floor and cried immediately. Physical examination reveals red mark on the forehead only, no skull hematoma, no activity, scenes fall, no vomiting, and neuro examination was appropriately normal. However, the emergency department wants you to set it for the head CT. Okay, the child is 11 month old and what should be the plan, the appropriate plan for the sedation. So the one is the spontaneous sleep. The child, if the child is start crying and after once he is tired, he will sleep spontaneous. It is the best time to get the head CT. Okay. If the child is not, not sleeping, the next option is pedicloral. The pedicloral is a very good option because it won't uh, sedate the child to the very much extent the respiratory depression happens. But the only problem is the child may be sleeping for a longer time and may hamper the further assessment of the neurological status. The third one is the midazolam. Yeah, midazolam is a very good option, but the dose which is given is it won't work immediately and child may be sleeping for a longer time if the dose is increased. And fourth is midazolam plus ketamine. Ketamine may be added in the minimal dose so that the child may sleep immediately and midazolam take over the rest of the time. The second scenario I will discuss, suppose this is a girl which I have taken the frame during my uh, one of the, my patients. He is a three and a half year old child. She had a stew of seizures and fell during the last episode of seizure. Uh, physical examination reveals abrasion and a swelling on the forehead. No skull hematoma, no vomiting. Normal neuro examination, emergency department wants to sedate me for the MRI head. See, the child is very active, but she doesn't want to go inside the MRI room. Even she is not cooperative and when she is taken for the IV cannulation, she starts crying. But she is very happy in playing with the mobile. So while playing with the mobile, I put an IV sedation line and she was distracted by her relatives. However, the further plan of sedation will be midazolam with propofol as per doses recommended. No ketamine because of two reasons. She had a stroke of seizure, which the ketamine has the excitatory properties, which may uh, cause the seizures as well as that there may be a cause some intracranial bleed and which may increase the intracranial tension. So midazolam with the propofol in the prescribed dose as per the doses is the best option for this child. I have one more scenario where a four-year-old child with asthma needed follow-up had MRI for stable uh, abnormality supposed that tuberous sclerosis, but on the screening, history, history and physical examinations, she has nighttime cuff for last one day and wheezing and nasal congestion. What would be my plan? The relatives want, since they have come, the parents have come from a long way, they want me to do the MRI. So what would I will do in such a scenario? 
simple it is the patient is asa2 but he is actually ill and his sedation exposes him to a higher risk so i will reschedule i will not go for the sedation at present until or unless it is a life threatening emergency since she had a stable abnormality i will reschedule her mri to a further date when his cough and wheezing are normal remember pre oxygenation is the key with the procedural sedation published adverse effects events during the pediatric radiological sedations varies from 2% to 18% consistently the most common adverse event is transient hypoxia because children basal oxygen use per kilogram is twice that of the adults and they have the smaller frc so transient hypoxia is always predictably seen with the popofol so always it is better to give the pre oxygenation very common with midazolam and fentanyl and less likely with ketamine unless coordinated with other respiratory depression i always pre oxygenate my child for 3 to 5 minutes and intra op oxygenation is attached it increases the safe apnea period before if anything happens for desaturation the same child suppose the sedation is to be given for the ct it is a less complex procedure use standard monitoring because there is no magnetic interference the anesthetic time is very less so choose your drug wisely if you give a long acting drug it the child will be sleeping for a longer time however there is a problem of high level of radiation if the child is crying and you have given the less sedation the time is very less so i can give the less sedation the child will be crying and you have to take the re and retake so there will be more and more exposure to the child which is not good uh, apart from that once the con contrast is given there may be the allergic reaction so always take a history of any allergic reaction previously see the symptoms like skin reactions airway obstruction angioedema and cvs collapse which could be because of the allergy treatments are standard treatment corticosteroids h1s2 blockers oxygen epinephrine beta 2 agonist intubation if required and lots of fluids the prevention if your child is having this uh, problem of this allergy and he has a previous episode of like this you can give the corticosteroids as a prophylactic measures and if suppose you have to give the ga for any type of diagnostic radiology see remember rooms rarely set up to accommodate general anesthesia always remember the place is not for the general anesthesia and if it is crucial to perform rigorous room check for equipments double check your supplemental oxygen delivery induction may be performed in a designated area to better meet the needs of airway management which is quite common nowadays in the pediatric hospitals ventilators that we are using in the mri stir with they although they are mri compatible but they are different from the anesthesia machines because they may not be accommodate able to accommodate inhalation agents so tiva could be a better option however nowadays mri compatible sevoflurane um, uh, when these are the ventil compatible inhalation agents are available where you can give the tag of the sevoflurane attached to the ventilator and keep the uh, sedation with the inhalation agent and if you are planning to extubate post uh, ga always remember imaging time must be considered if the neuromuscular block is is to be used once the mri and ct has given and you have to discharge the criteria the prob the standard protocol is a specific vital sign should be normal regain pre sedation consciousness and communication skills that is the child should be able to talk he should be able to cry should be able to meet with you should be able to talk, walk if it is not then at, at least he should be able to tolerate oral foods and fluid there is always there is a university of migan sedation score which says that 0 to awake to alert to 4 unarousable and the score should be or less than 2 so that she or he should be transferred out for the home and with this i will conclude my presentation is a friendly reminder evidence is still a minor driving force in medical practice individual individualization is more important everyone has his fancies and everyone has his way of giving the anesthesia in such a scenario so but the standard asa guidelines should always be followed thank you very much thank you sir uh, thank you very much uh, lalit and uh, i uh, there are two other chair persons Uh, I would like yeah. uh, Dr. Uh, Indrani to and Dr. Uh, Thank you very much for a very exhaustive and uh, complete presentation on this very important topic, and uh, it's easily presented. But when you actually have to give anesthesia in such remote locations, and also guarding the safety. in a in a uh, pediatric age group it is extremely challenging and uh, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation thank you and i just would want to share uh, one uh, uh, 
uh, episode which uh, i had experienced uh, long long ago uh, we had a small child who uh, was posted for uh, uh, for an mri and uh, i don't remember exactly what but post the mri the child uh, was all right was discharged home it was a sedation and we had given propofol uh, to this uh, very high temperature and uh, we could not uh, understand why the patient had such high temperatures and uh, one thing which uh, everybody thought was probably the propofol uh, temperature was not maintained and maybe because of the propofol patient uh, developed uh, you know rigors and, and fever and sepsis so this was one thing again because it is a remote location sometimes even uh, drugs are not kept properly maybe but we we had no sure shot uh, uh, no no sure shot uh, what do you call uh, thing about what was the reason Uh, the the child uh, developed this much of uh, septicemia and the child had to be admitted in the intensive care eventually went home but uh, one uh, thing which everyone was pointing was at the propofol so what is have you got any experience about this ma'am not exactly with the propofol but i had an experience with the drug uh, uh, we had a child of uh, around 6 month the baby was okay we give the ketamine and midazolam sedation to him that he was feeding well and uh, the mother was went away and suddenly she came running back the child has become blue that after 2 hours and after it, uh, the baby was discharged and after 2 hours of that even the sedation would have been weaned off but suddenly he becomes uh, becomes because of the residual effect of the sedation he started he stopped taking breath and he becomes a blue we immediately resuscitated and he becomes all right in another 5 minutes and she again was very happy so it could be a drug effect or it could be some idiosyncratic reaction type or ma'am it could be some reaction to the some previously which would have been aggravated by the drugs we have few experience like this only yeah and i don't know whether dr jiggy remembers i was long back his student in tata memorial and once uh, from the ct suit uh, i had a child who developed a reaction to the uh, to the uh, what do you call uh, this one and we had to take the child up for to the icu the child eventually did well so uh, so that was another experience i had on the ct suit that's why ma'am it's a completely remote yeah it's completely remote is jiggy there i can't see him yeah uh, so once uh, i remember uh, sir again once i remember uh, we were posted in the ct when i was a resident i am talking about my residential time and uh, we were posted in ct we had to go to the report in the operation theater from the operation theater we had to go to the ct suit so we had some problem in the operation theater so i had to reach i reached the ct suit very little late and there was a child was completely covered up and you know i had to give sedation to the child and uh, then i asked about all the history and everything fasting everything and i and since all of them were after me you know then i gave the sedation and i removed removed the clothes and i found the patient had you know red uh, hemangiomas all over luckily the child did well but you know what here again uh, another bad experience i had and i was literally sweating through the uh, through the ct and you know and the the child eventually did well but then the child had hemangioma the child was completely covered till here you know the child had hemangioma all over the chest and all that so that was another very bad experience i had in the ct long long ago I, i think jiggy is not there uh, lalit i think one thing i would like everybody to notice that he gave a very important clue that if the child is uh, is hungry and if he even if he uh, you know uh, he is brought to the suite and a little bit of sedation is given sometimes you know i i i know of a, of an anesthesiologist with the, with with dr gulati center who makes the mother feed the child just 
uh, just a little bit of feed of say about two hours earlier, and the, then the child sleeps off like through them. the thing. So, so what you said was the natural sleep, and if the child has not slept and he is hungry and so on, or uh, maybe the sucrose thing which you talked about. Uh, then the other thing which I wanted you to comment on that uh, we have had some uh, experience in our center wherein the child has multiple congenital uh, deformities of the facial area. So how many times, uh, you know, have you uh, kind of uh, accessed the air uh, airway, say with a, with a tube or a, or a supraglottic device before taking him into an uh, MRI or CT suite? Sir. The thing is that you are completely, completely right, sir. We have even we have the experience that with the pedicular, the child is when not sleeping. If you give a little bit of feed, the child sleeps like rock, and you yeah. are able to get the MRI done with little sedation. Even with the one and half hour sedation, uh, MRI procedure is done very easily with this little bit of sedation and feed, but not with the other drug. However, it can be the the oral pedicular. It is a very effective drug, and yeah. suppose sometimes the child sleeps. The other thing is that sir, we have experience where we had a mammy congenital anomalies on the face as well as on the back and we were thought that the managing of the airway in the MRI would not be easier for us. So what we did, we did, we brought to our ICU area, we intubated the patient in the pre-op room, we took all the precautions and then shifted and the, with all the precautions to the MRI center, get the long lines attached with our MRI machines, although it was previously checked by our residents and then we get it done and then we extubated. After the MRI to the back to our ICU bed and kept in the observation for few hours. And uh, it was actually in the till evening. So that, so is, that, that is that why is I, the... I wanted you to cover, uh, you know, touch upon that because yeah, yeah, there sir. are situations where we should not wait uh, for going into the MRI and then deciding on a on a on a uh, definitive airway device. It is much better in our own, uh, you know, areas which we are we are totally controlled with, controlled. like whether whether it is an ICU as you said. Or, or maybe an emergency OT area where we have all the things at our uh, disposal. And then uh, safely we take him and get him back to that very place and so on. So yeah, that's why I called MRI is made, MRI center are made for the radiologist for not yes, anesthesiologist. Absolutely. That's why we have to make our arrangements and our comfortable and should not compelled by their pressure. We, it has to be done immediately or now in this setting, we should be able to manage to console them with what is good for the patient. Yes. And if we are able to justify that, then it's okay. Thank you, Lalit, for a wonderful presentation. Dr. Rakesh, the, the he, he, is he, has, he has rightly justified his talk, sir. <laughs> yes. He justified the uh, MRI configuration, but Dr. Lalit Gupta, heartiest congratulations for justifying yes. your talk. Wonderful. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on board. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And thank you, uh, RSAC, for, uh, for this great opportunity. For Thanks great a opportunity. Lot. Thanks a lot. Thank sir. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so you. much, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for giving such thoughtful and summary, a thoughtful summary of a very important topic. And thank you, Dr. Dalit Gupta, also. Thank you, sir. Uh, due to uh, some unforeseen circumstances, our next speaker may not be able to join. There is some emergency, medical emergency at her home. She should need to join uh, her, so she will not be able to join. But uh, we have already uh, experts uh, with us who are experts in area management. So I can take a little liberty here uh, from them so that they can just highlight some of the important aspects for uh, airway management. So we have uh, Dr. J.V. Divetia here. We also have Professor Rakesh Kumar. So this will be just extempo. Uh, uh, can I request uh, Dr. J.V. Divetia to highlight some of the key points that would be essential for uh, airway management outside the operating room, like uh, critically ill patients who require airway management. So can you give us just few uh, take home messages that will be useful to us? Uh, Rakesh, good evening. So I was not supposed to be speaking. Uh, I was only supposed to be introducing and saying thank you for a wonderful lecture. <laughs> but, I'm just uh, taking a liberty of uh, yeah. you but being the, the experts. But, and... but where did you disappear suddenly? And you have really... <laughs> I had some couple of phone calls to attend. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so this, uh, yeah, so when you're talking of uh, airway management in the ICU, I think there are three or four important differences from what you get in what we do in the OT. So one is the environment, the ICU environment. And as you know, the ICU environment can be pretty chaotic and it's uh, 
you know you don't have all the kind of help that you have when you have a in the ot uh, starting from assistants to residents and drugs very often there's just one person who's assisted by uh, by nurses or technicians so the uh, the bed is you know can't get around the bed and all those obstacles are there the ventilators tubings and all those sort of things then there is the person who's intubating the operator and uh, what unfortunately seems to happen is that at 3 in the morning you've got the sickest patient in the hospital having to be intubated by the most junior doctor who's on duty in the icu and you know who doesn't have any senior experts uh, experienced people to help and the third and probably most important is the patient now the patient is you know most likely let's say he's got hypoxic respiratory failure so he's hypoxic to start with he's not doing well on oxygen or high flow nasal oxygen that he may be on his functional residual capacity is reduced and your attempts at preoxidation may not optimally preoxidate him you know even if you uh, so essentially what happens is if you do a rapid sequence intubation and you cause apnea you will get a very very short apnea time and the patient will desaturate if you take say more than 30 seconds or even less than that at intubation so, and the patient may be hemodynamically unstable you know he may be septic so he got a high oxygen demand so these patient can desaturate very fast and therefore the incidence of cardiac arrest severe hypoxia severe hypotension is much more common in critically ill patients in the icu and emergency department than we are used to seeing in the operation theater so these are the few things which make intubation fairly dangerous unless you are pretty careful and the key is of course you have to have a stable hemodynamically stable induction you need to preoxidate your patient well and try to increase the frc so non invasive ventilation with peep has been shown to improve the uh, oxygenation and pre uh, improve preoxygenation and increase the uh, duration of uh, apnea that you can achieve you know after you've given a muscle relaxant of uh, uh, so high flow nasal oxygen may work but probably in sick patients non invasive ventilation with peep seems to be the best way to deoxygenate these patients they may require cricoid pressure and you know they might require bougies and all to intubate and basically your first attempt is your best attempt because if you put your tube in the esophagus or if you have to take multiple attempts all of them increase the chances of severe hypoxia and cardiac arrest developing so you have to be really sure that you your first attempt becomes your best attempt so i think these are the sort of key sort of differences between intubating in the icu and intubating uh, in the operating theater i think very important key points you have highlighted is just not the anatomical difficult airway but critically ill patients do have physiological difficult airway that needs to be remembered and the technique of preoxygenation may be a little different but we do for in the operation theater as compared to uh, which we should need to do for our critically ill patients uh, may request and, uh, and of course in this covid era with ppe and all those things it becomes a little more challenging uh, as well and, absolutely uh, how about uh, considering you know uh, the the things that you mentioned that they, they are likely to desaturate very rapidly uh, you know uh, i feel that there is a there is a great potential for second generation uh, sids uh, through which we can intubate as well once we once we have uh, quick control on the airway and can ventilate through those and uh, then uh, at peace we can uh, we can uh, intubate through those what do you talk about, what do you think about those you know i always feel that they are they are uh, they are slightly pushed to the background in the icu even in the emergency room because uh, I, i know of a number of emergency physicians that they they are also i i talk to keep on talking to them why don't you why don't you uh, you know uh, buy time and 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 have a wonderful control over the airway With a, with a second generation device through which you can intubate uh, at peace with a fibroscope no yeah, so again that's not a bad option mm-hmm. but it all depends on how bad your lung is if, yeah. if your lung is stiff then even with a second generation device you know the pressure of seal pressure of 30 or 35 yeah. may not be enough and then you will not uh, get effective ventilation absolutely. and you get air leak and distension yeah. so it, it depends on how bad the lung is and how stiff the lung is and what sort of pressures you are generating right. and again you know uh, for the average person who's in the emergency department or icu or average resident or even a you know, to do a fiber optic intubation through a second generation device in a hypoxic patient may 
or may not be able to do it quickly enough you know so and f- frankly it's never been evaluated in that fashion yes we have evaluated conventional intubation but that has not been evaluated so yeah, yeah. in a principle it's a good idea because you are ventilating all the way you know and you've got control but it depends on the sort of pressures that are required to inflate so there's a obese patient on top and yeah, all those sorts of things those issues need to be taken into account absolutely i think uh, we got a very important key message so thank you so much sir thank you to devetia and dr rakesh yeah. kumar for and giving rakesh, an insight uh, into the yeah. last key message i want to give is in the ot yes, we sir. always say wake up the patient reverse the patient if you are intubating someone who needs to go on a ventilator for respiratory failure so getting the patient out of anesthesia or out of relaxant is not an option so you know you have to secure the airway and therefore the surgical airway access also becomes very important and one way you know is what dr rakesh was saying is even if you are having difficulty in putting a tube in get a supraglottic device in and then quickly go ahead with a percutaneous tracheostomy or Absolutely. something like that you know so that's also a thing thank you dr devetia uh, uh, for covering up for dr shela mehtra and uh, yes she really had a, a, a acute emergency oh yeah she left early from work i know that so uh, so thank you for pitching in and uh, enlightening the delegates about the emergency airway management outside the or and yes unguarded so thank you very much for your inputs and uh, thank you dr thank rakesh you. kumar sir thank you very much thank you thank you uh, thank you so much for uh, these great inputs sir what happened to sangeeta she's coming she's she's, she's next, next. Okay. she's next she's next so so, okay. so over to dr uh, sood ma'am so we are sharing the screen of uh, dr sangeeta and she is back ma'am over to dr sood dr jashish sood ma'am okay so should i start <laughs> Yes ma'am please yeah please. yeah 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 sangeeta i'm sorry <laughs> please start thank you ma'am thank you for that generation uh, introduction which you gave for me and i'm very sorry for the technical glitch that occurred and i think uh, next uh, next dr rakesh okay so i think we have all been talking about the challenges and we know what we face when we are in the non operating room uh, anesthesia that brings to us like about not having a skilled technician having the not the most advanced of the machines and uh, maybe the anesthetist also generally who is posted there maybe the junior most in the department and he may be away from the operating room so after knowing all those challenges also we have to give anesthesia in these areas and each of these areas as we know as we are hearing has their own uh, uh, challenge that it brings to us so looking at the endoscopies if we see what are the common endoscopic procedures that are performed the most basic is a esophageal gastro duodenoscopy then we have a simple colonoscopy or a flexible sigmoidoscopy then now we have more advanced and complex procedures these are technically challenging also and are for much longer duration like the ercp the sphinct sphinct sphinctotomies uh banding of the esophageal varices endoscopic ultrasound then we may have a ch- child coming in for some foreign body retrieval bariatric uh, procedures which are done minimally invasive uh, the double balloon endoscopies and now we have capsule endoscopies so these are other complex procedures and we need to know about these procedures because if we are not well versed with them we will not know what kind of anesthesia we need to provide for them next so uh, coming to the next slide the unique considerations in endoscopy are that there is sharing of the airway and loss of airway bleeding the patient there is a chance that the patient may start bleeding during the procedure or we may have a bleeding patient who comes to us for banding of the esophageal varices hypoxemia and hypoxemia hypoxia is a very common uh, finding in these patients co2 retention can occur during the procedure and aspiration is the most common problem that we see in these cases and most of them being uh, performed as day care procedures add a additional uh, uh, stress to us because we have to ensure that the pa- procedure has been done safely and the patient can go home uh, and is in a position to go home also so if we look at the various uh, preparation that we need to have in the endoscopy room i think most of them have already been highlighted 
as in other areas we need to have a continuous flow of oxygen a high flow oxygen is preferable and recomm uh, and recommended pipe suction should be present immediate uh, access to a resuscitation trolley and an and good anesthesia machine with the the oxygen cylinder as a backup and our anesthesia monitor and defibrillator should be present the staffing there should be at least one anesthetist with a skilled technician who is well versed in an area one or two staff nurses who know about the procedure as well as know where all the emergency drugs are kept and drugs that we really need are our emergency drugs along with that the anesthesia drugs like propofol glycopyrrolate atropine sexamethonium and atrocurium should be present uh, along with the endoscopy room we have to have an area which is identified which is known as the recovery area where the patient will be kept and will be monitored uh, and this area should again be monitored along with two recovery nurses who are going to monitor the, those patients in that area for a minimum of 2 hours before that before which they can they can be sent home so looking at the uh, various types of anesthesia dr lalit has discussed uh, endoscopy can be done purely under local anesthesia it, if it is just a small procedure the an, an, in an adult who is not anxious it it can be done under minimal sedation we can have it in moderate to deep sedation provided by an anesthesiologist or under general anesthesia with or without endotracheal intubation how to classify the various levels of uh, anes uh, sedation and anesthesia is basically minimal sedation the patient is it has a has a normal response to verbal stimulation the airway spontaneous uh, ventilation and cardiovascular function remain unaffected in moderate sedation or conscious sedation as it is known there is purposeful response to verbal stimulation airway spontaneous ventilation and cardiovascular function will be uh, well maintained in deep sedation there is purposeful response only to painful stimulation airway may get involved and we may need to uh, take care of it and in general anesthesia we know that in we need to take care of the airway as well as the spontaneous ventilation and the cardiovascular function may be compromised so when we look at into all these uh, various scenarios we need to know what is the uh, next doctor gar monitoring that we need to do uh, the fast okay when we look at the patient the pre op fasting guidelines have to be main, uh, have to be followed as uh, in uh, other uh, procedures there was a study when uh, the endoscopists have found that if the patient was fasting for less than 2 hours and if the uh, has patient has fasted for 8 hours the incidence of complications like nausea regurgitation and intubation stasis of liquids as well as solids and the risk of aspiration is much much lower and the patients need to be worked up as in uh, usual uh, cases they should have the basic investigations in place we should have a history of the allergies the cardiac status other important thing is whether the patient is wearing dentures or not is an extremely important history and all this needs to be doc documented we at medanta we have a procedure sheet where uh, the documentation is done there is a uh, basic it's not a Uh, in depth psc but it's a very basic psc along with that we follow the who procedural uh, sign in and time out it may not be as elaborate as the one we don't do in the theater but a basic sign in where we have identified the patient checked his consent uh, ensured that he is for the procedure which has been marked and the uh, time out at the time of at the time of time out we have the anesthetist the uh, technician the nurse and the endoscopist all present in the room monitoring is clinical monitoring standard asa monitoring is applied when ga is planned or otherwise also in deep sedation ecg pulse oximetry and nibp should be there clinical monitoring of consciousness respiration and discomfort should be done both the asa as well as the american society of gastroenterologists recommend that pulse oximetry should be used during all sedated endoscopic procedures and capnography should be present in the patient monitoring protocols especially if we are targeting deep sedation in moderate sedation we may or may not have a capnography with us and just looking at the patient and watching his respiration may be good enough other than that presence of supplemental oxygen uh, has to be there when we are providing moderate sedation it is required for all procedures with for deep sedation and uh, high flow nasal cannula is supposed to be considered extremely useful in these patients both undergoing routine as well as advanced upper gi endoscopic procedures and uh, coming to the various uh, when we are talking of the various uh, techniques by which we can provide uh, sedation or anesthesia 
as we were discussing uh, patients who are older who are sicker and uh, not anxious and do not have any history of abdominal pain or discomfort they can undergo endoscopy or colonoscopy with little or no sedation the use of water assisted or carbon dioxide in suppletion reduces pain during and after the pr procedure in both unsedated as well as sedated colonoscopy in these patients maybe a little bit of an analgesic like uh, tramadol or diclofenac may just be enough to help them to tide over the procedure when we talk about uh, uh, what are the indications for anesthetist led because in the uh, uh, not in our country but in in the us the uh, gastroenterologists as well as the endoscopists are allowed to give sedation and propofol is the most commonly used uh, drug because they undergo a training and they are credentialed to to, to do so so uh, they have the american society of guidelines which allows them to give uh, propofol but in our country because we do not have any such credential credentialing we do not allow our uh, endoscopists or gastroenterologists to use propofol they are allowed to use only fentanyl or midazolam so anesthetists are generally required for most of the endoscopic uh, procedures and uh, some of these procedures especially like a polypectomy or uh, surgeries for ecclesia cardia then uh, endoscopic bariatric surgery patients coming with large variceal bleeds foreign bodies any procedure which is in being carried out in uh, a patient who is more than asa 3 definitely requires an anesth anesthetist to be around and therapeutic procedures which are lasting for more than 60 minutes then in for as far as the pancreatic and hepatobiliary are concerned then we have like an endoscopic ultrasound or an ercp uh, small device uh, small bowel device uh, assisted endoscopy as well as double balloon or single balloon uh, spiral endoscopies and in the lower gi complex polypectomies or again any other prolonged uh, therapeutic procedures definitely should have the presence of the anesthetist in the uh, endoscopy suit so uh, what is the thing that is important is basically we need to one is to allay the anxiety of the patient the second is we need to take care of the gag or the pharyngeal reflex and we see that in this the afferent is by the ninth nerve whereas the efferent is by the vagus so when we uh, those uh, endoscope uh, endoscopist is when the gastroenterologist is introducing the endoscope at that point of time we have to blunt this response and to blunt this response what we can do is uh, next doctor we can either uh, just you know give an upfront blow bolus of an induction agent which commonly most commonly we, we use is propofol or we can use fentanyl which can be used as an adjunct to propofol the second important thing that we need to do is that we need to keep the patient immobile in during this uh, time especially when they are working in the areas of the esophagus and stomach and here this we can maintain with a stable infusion of propofol or if we are using dexmedetomidine or any other drug which we are common with so if we see most commonly used drugs in endoscopy are again uh, uh, talking of with their fentanyl and midazolam which can be used as boluses and when we talk of infusions it can be uh, propofol dexmedetomidine or ketamine or ketofol in patients uh, who are uh, cardiovascularly un unstable and uh, hemo and have a cardiovascular compromise and uh, nowadays there are certain newer drugs and studies have been performed using oliseridine it is a newer opioid and remimazolam which is a shorter acting benzodiazepine and remimazolam may be available in the indian market quite soon that is what uh, some of the companies have come up with so when we are talking about moderate sedation moderate sedation can be provided with a benzo combination of benzodiazepine and opioid which is usually uh, midazolam and uh, fentanyl we have to ensure that antagonists to this that is naloxone and flumazenil are readily available in the endoscopy unit and if we think that benzodiazepine combination is not working then sometimes addition of promethazine droperidol or diphenhydramine may help us in many centers it is only propofol which is used and the use of propofol is known as balanced propofol sedation uh sedesis was one of these patient controlled uh, propofol uh, infusion pumps which was introduced uh, uh, in the us but because it was not uh, it was uh, after a few studies it was found that it was not able to provide the desired depth as uh, required it has it is not very commonly used and it went out of uh, repute 
there are various uh, recommendations which have been if we are using propofol during endoscopy a sedation team with appropriate education and training should be present along with at least one person who is qualified in ala in acls the trained person should be dedicated to uninterrupted monitoring that is the person who is monitoring and providing the drug should not be the same as the physician who is uh, provide doing the endoscopy physiologic monitoring must include pulse oximetry ecg as well as uh, intermittent blood pressure oxygen monitoring by pulse oximetry is not a substitute for monitoring ventilatory function capnography must be considered because it may decrease the risks for deep sedation and continuous monitoring will allow recognition of patients who have progressed to a deeper level of sedation the personnel should also know how to rescue a patient who becomes unresponsive or is unable to protect his airway or loses spontaneous or respiratory or cardiovascular function and age appropriate equipment for airway manage, uh, management and resuscitation must be immediately available a physician should be present throughout propofol sedation and he must be immediately available until the patient meets the discharge criteria that is in the post op recovery area and in that whole endoscopy area there should be a trained person trained in acls who who can you know take care of these patients before they are home before they are ready to go home uh, there are these these are the various uh, trials which have been performed and um, meta analysis which have been carried out by kadir ertal in 2005 and then mekard and singh in 2008 where they have compared propofol and traditional in agents generally include fentanyl and midazolam and they found that using only propofol compared to traditional agents the percentage of hypoxemia hypotension as well as the other complications was much lower as when you know we even a combination of agents like uh, fentanyl midazolam and propofol was used so they said that uh, using only propofol in these procedures is much better safer and we can get the desired depth and uh, the recommended doses is usually a bolus of 1 to 1.5 mg per kg followed by an infusion of 100 to 150 mics per kg per uh, minute that is what uh, has been used in most of these uh, uh, studies and uh, trials and uh, Uh, then we have the patient control sedation also where uh, propofol has been used and cooling et al found that uh, patients receiving patient control sedation with propofol and fentanyl exhibited a higher degree of patient satisfaction and more complete recovery at 45 minutes when compared to conventional sedation and analgesia again ng et al have reported that patients undergoing colonoscopy with propofol patient control sedation had a shorter recovery time and improved comfort when compared to just uh, using midazolam alone similarly hughes et al also said that younger and more anxious patients are less likely to agree to uh, he said that younger and more anxious patients are less likely to ag agree to uh, uh, patient controlled uh, sedation so in endoscopy patient controlled sedation using propofol is something which is very commonly used and is associated with much less complications the other uh, uh, drugs that have been used is dexmedetomidine which has also been used in gastrointestinal endoscopic procedures the only reason i think why i mean we all know it's a lovely drug and we can be used for infusion and uh, uh, provides good uh, sedation and analgesia but i think the only reason why it is not very commonly used is one it uh, we need to you know we uh, if especially if you have a rapid turnover unit then we do not have as much time where we can take in the patient give him this uh, you know the bolus dose slowly over the 15 20 minutes and then uh, keep him on the maintenance dose and secondly i think the incidence of uh, bradycardia and hypotension and the recovery time with dexmedetomidine is slightly longer then when compared to propofol if when we have used that in the in those doses hence uh, dexmedetomidine is not as commonly used uh, or uh, as compared to uh, propofol uh, in quite a few uh, endoscopy areas but yes if you you we just have to do one or two cases then definitely it is a very good drug to use uh, as i was describing this is a new opioid it is a g protein uh, which binds to the g protein of the mu receptor and it's an opioid uh, agonist and uh, they have said that it it can be a new uh, drug which can be used to provide uh, analgesia and pain relief in gi endoscopy and sedation uh, it is it is fda approved and available in the us and it is available as 1 mg per ml and 2 mg per ml 
it can be given as a you know, infusion also and the doses as a pca and the doses are 0.25 to 0.5 mg iv bolus the other drug that we were describing is remimazolam and remimazolam is also been used in quite a few endoscopies it is also available as 20 mg uh, while the dose being 0.05 mg and uh, uh, 0.05 mg per kg not to exceed 0.075 mg per kg and uh, it is rapid onset the effect of uh, comes within 1 to 2 minutes and duration is just 15 minutes and hence it is a shorter duration uh, uh, benzodiazepine maybe if it is available in the indian market it could be a promising drug which can be used for our uh, endoscopic uh, procedures the airway adjuncts that we would need is if uh, the patient goes into you know deeper uh, sedation is simply we can just use a nasopharyngeal airway most of the times that is useful we also have an endoscopic mask in case we need to ventilate or just give some kind of positive pressure uh, or some breaths to the patient if he goes into a deeper plane of uh, sedation we also have uh, the lma gastro which has come in and this lma gastro provides space for the endoscope to pass along with that there is a suction port and in this we can also connect our catheter mount and our entitral uh, monitoring so the ca capnography and carbon dioxide uh, entitral carbon dioxide monitoring can be performed this is quite useful in our in long procedures and uh, where you know which lasts for more than 60 minutes and uh, we have control of the airway these are other modifications which have been used where a catheter mount is connected to the nasopharyngeal airway and uh, we can do the entitral monitoring as well as provide uh, positive pressure uh, to the patient this is another uh, where we have a mapleson breathing circuit assembly this was another where we have a uh, you know lma through which we can introduce the tube as well as the fiber optic bronchoscope or the endoscope if we want to provide uh, certain airway adjuncts and uh, use these modifications too if we, you know we are not we are, if we are not intubating these patients and uh, using the lma for uh, sedation and endoscopic procedures so endo endotracheal intubation is with, is not very commonly performed in these patients and it is only when you know we anticipate that large amount of fluids are present in the stomach like the patient is full stomach or he has a very severe bleed or a gastric outlet obstruction or we need to do foreign body retrieval uh, this table shows us the you know indications for endotracheal intubation in these patients and they have scored that you know patients who are you know having a score of more than 4 are the ones who are a definite indication for endotracheal intubation that is that the bmi is more than 35 the procedure is an urgent procedure or it is being done on a holiday the risk of aspiration or a patient has a history of gastroesophageal reflux disease and or he has a bleed patient is hemodynamically unstable and if you see the airway the malam patti score is more than 3 so in these cases or whenever uh, 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 we can use uh, whenever the score is more than 4 then those patients ideally should be electively intubated before we take them for any endoscopic procedure uh the most common complication that we face is aspiration and that is what we are always scared of because we have abolished the gag reflex with uh, local pharyngeal anesthesia maybe or because of the intravenous uh, sedation that we have uh, used and also because of the passage of the endoscope the upper esophageal sphincter uh, is open and all this predisposes to uh, uh, the predisposes us the, the patient to aspiration and sometimes we have to perform endoscopies with patients who are on full stomach or they are bleeding or you know the bowel uh, there is a uh, there is a small bowel obstruction and this is one complication which we dread and we need to take adequate precautions to uh, prevent this uh, complication and this can be done with uh, we should be uh, predictors uh, include the uh, presence of severe gastroesophageal reflux disease hiatal hernia stricted stricture esophagus history of esophagectomies gastroparesis post pyloric obstruction or presence of uh, zenker's uh, diverticulum and uh, if uh, aspiration we can prevent it if we have ensured that the patient is fasting adequately we have done an inter i'll tell them to do an intermittent decompression secure our airway 
position prone position is what is used commonly in these uh, procedures and we should have a good functioning suction machine available with us and uh, post procedure the patient should be shifted to a post anesthesia care unit or a recovery unit the monitoring should continue as per the asa guidelines patient should be kept npo for 2 hours post operative nausea vomiting prophylaxis should be given provided to them uh, we have to watch for aspiration even in the post op and if required maybe a chest x ray should be done where patient should be checked whether he is ready for discharge or not maybe if uh, and all this needs to be documented documentation is extremely important whether it is uh, intra op uh, uh, the pac the intra op as well as the post op and only when the patient has me met the required discharge criteria he should be allowed to go home if not he may have an extended stay in the hospital and he should not be sent home the discharge criteria generally what we have is the <clears throat> aldrid score which we are using and if the patient has an aldrid score of more than 9 then there is a less than 0.2% incidence that he may have a complication or sedation related event so when he has met that score he can be allowed to go home there are various guidelines which have been uh, published by the for sedation and anesthesia and gi endoscopy we have the uh, american uh, society of gastroenterologists most of them uh are talk i mean i have covered in the various uh, points above and the some other things that they also say that the anesthesia provider assistant should be considered for prolonged or therapeutic endoscopic procedures requiring deep sedation when there is anticipated intolerance to standard sedatives or when there is an increased risk for adverse event especially in asa uh, four or five patients also if when patients have increased risk for airway obstruction because of some anatomic variant covid is uh, another pandemic and we are all living with it and endoscopies do continue to be performed even at this time but we need to know that endoscopy is also a highly infective aerosol uh, is performed in a highly infective aerosol generating environment and all anti covid measures have to be followed and if uh, we have i mean if we have to do these uh, patients who are covid suspect or you know covid uh, positive then we should identify one room which where we are going to be uh, performing endoscopy for uh, all the patients you know have mark a separate if we have multiple suit then one uh, suit should be dedicated specially for these uh, the covid uh, patients thank you thank you doctor uh thank you very much sangeeta for that very elaborate uh, sub the subject that you covered in such an elaborate manner you covered every part of it and uh, truly speaking uh, just want to highlight a few points that you had already mentioned a modified pac form is important you know you don't have especially the centers where you have the y high volume endoscopic surgery endoscopic procedures going on uh, you don't have time to fill up the elaborate pac form so you should have your own modified pac form plus the technique that you have done of course and post op the uh, discharge criteria as dr sangeeta has mentioned um there are a few questions in the chat box but i just like to, uh, to add one thing sangeeta is the intubation which we said again there are some surgeries which are being done commonly uh, very often in the high volume centers like the poem that you must have heard about and you are, i'm sure you are doing it there itself a per oral entero a myotomy endoscopic myotomy where uh, ga with endotracheal intubation is the norm and our center is doing a lot of these procedures and in this to remember although sangeeta has highlighted about the co2 literally in this the co2 is insufflated submucosally so in in the initial phases we had seen complications like we saw in laparoscopy so uh, those centers who are going to start these procedures you have to remember good monitoring like we had for the uh, laparoscopic procedures can occur here as well and those complications and the management are the same as we have for those um can we take some questions that are there in the chat box i don't think my co chair is there so a few questions sangeeta for you are first of all somebody has asked about the discharge criteria you have already answered somebody has asked what is your opinion on the use of butrophenol in endoscopic procedures yeah, honestly i have not 
use it so i really don't i don't think i can come out on that i mean commonly what we are using is our fentanyl midazolam and propofol along with dexmet at times and uh, ketofol in uh, the high risk patients so yes. i if anybody else is willing to talk i'm not used to it. no i i agree with you you know fentanyl and uh, uh, this thing midazolam propofol are the ones which are commonly used so really nor have i used it and uh, is it freely available i really don't know it's not very popular in our setup okay. uh, availability is there madam but yes uh -huh. use in front of uh, with the uh, uh, fentanyl and midazolam is less yeah. but but if not yeah. otherwise available yeah okay right uh and somebody wants to has asked you can you highlight about double endoscopy highlight mean what do you i think what is done in it and concerns in the ebus the concerns basically revolve around that yes it is uh, a long i mean the duration of the procedure is uh, i mean it's a long duration procedure and uh, we i mean we need to ensure that uh, simultaneously the aspiration of the gastric contents uh, you know whatever they are using is also you know the suction is also been done simultaneously so that the patient does not you know there is less regurgitation and he does not uh, aspirate much right i think that should answer their question basically all the procedures which have the risk of aspiration is better to have the tube in um mm. concerns in double endoscopy and anesthesia that's it uh, the same thing would you like to repeat it it's the intubation and the uh, concern of the length of the procedure and uh, is that right sangeeta yes ma'am okay uh, somebody says he would want to tell his experience on colonoscopy anesthesia to shar choksi navin how can we get that person any uh, to shar i am unmuting you and uh, okay. you can uh, he wants to tell his experience yeah, on colonoscopy yeah. anesthesia uh, uh, to shar you can unmute yourself now and go ahead please dr to shar and Hello, by the time dr navin yes yeah, I have done my colonoscopy since last thirty years. More than ten thousand colonoscopies I have completed, and there are three golden rules I have seen in my practical anesthesia. One, all the colonoscopy patients are dehydrated because of the pagleg and recurrent diarrhea. So never, never allowed that patient to be transferred by walking. Only transferred by stretchers. Second thing, always start the infusion line with the one five hundred ml or pint because. most of the mortality and morbidity occurs in colonoscopy anesthesia because of the hypoglycemia and hypotension even if you give 1 1 mg midazolam then also there is a much hypotension and third thing is before coming to colonoscopy procedure always do the sugar level because all these patients are old age patients and these patients are very vulnerable to even slightest sedation in the colonoscopy room so my experience is that these three golden rules to be done very nicely and third thing i am using only kpd mixers in and i am very comfortable from the sedation to anesthesia in all this and i give 2.5 0.5 0.5 mixture of ketamine propofol and dexmedetomidine so all these drugs mimics each other's actions and they give very nice results thank you right uh, thank you very much uh, yes of course you know as we said that anybody who has got a lot of experience with one particular procedure all the time definitely gets the knack of it very true absolutely and possibly in our place we are very happy with midazolam and fentanyl and propofol and of course if required ketamine as sangeeta has said thanks a lot or anjugrewal also had written uh, one question about uh, lma uh, gastro yes. so dr anjugrewal yeah. go ahead uh, Um, we have yeah. had experience with LMA gastro, but had um, problems coming in when when we used it with uh, double barrel or with endoscopic ultrasound because I believe the size of the endoscope doesn't fit in into the LMA gastro. So it's a good device to use in routine endoscopies, but uh, there was yeah. a technical yeah. issue with that. Yeah, it's it's so, not very. I mean, it's a limited use uh, thing. It it can't be used in most. Yeah, that is what there's a problem with it, but. that is the only thing which we have now which can be <laughs> yes yes true yeah so possibly intubation would be better if the situation requires 
um, any other questions or comments otherwise i think uh, it was all a very very a good presentation and thank you so much uh, sangeeta thank you mom thank you so much i'm sorry for no 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 thank you very much and uh, somebody has just asked concerns with lma what was this one minute let me just get this last question concerns with lma and anesthesia and endoscopy sangeeta will you take that one concerns with lma and anesthesia lma can in endoscopy is a very that's what i think dr anju also said it's a very limited use because uh, you know that the problem of passing the endoscope and then doing the suction and obviously the risk because it's a if the agitation in these patients who are full stomach happens and it's a very large amount of fluid so you know it is just a rescue device which we can use it and or maybe for very short procedures otherwise wherever we think that we have to give general anesthesia then endotracheal intubation has to be our uh, choice absolutely absolutely thank you so much thanks, uh, thanks a lot thank you so much uh, dr sangeeta kanna ma'am for a wonderful session and dr jashree sood ma'am as usual for wonderful summary and interaction thank you so much ma'am uh, we come to our much. last session and uh, may I request the chairperson uh, to join this session Dr. Sabri Swaika, she is professor and head Department of Emergency Medicine at Institute of Postgraduate Medical Education and Research, SSKM Hospital, Kolkata. She is vice president of uh, RSCP National. She is also vice past president of ISA West Bengal and founder chairperson of IDA Kolkata. She is an excellent teacher, academician, and clinician par excellence. Uh, welcome, ma'am. The next uh, chairperson is Dr. Josna Goswami. She is senior consultant and head at Department of Anesthesia, Critical Care and Pain at Tata Medical Center, Kolkata. She is trained in anesthesia for liver transplantation and hepatobiliary surgery in King's College, London, and University of Minnesota, USA. She has numerous publications in national and international journals and book chapters. She is president of ISA Metro City, Kolkata. She is DC member of Society of Hong Kong Anesthesia and Perioperative Care. And she's also an EC member of IDA. Welcome, ma'am. And last but not the least, our own uh, Dr. Anju Grewal. She is uh, a professor at Department of Anesthesiology at Dayanand Medical College and Hospital, Ludhiana, Punjab. She has, uh, uh, though she mentioned uh, experience of 24 years, but I am sure that she has experience of, uh, practical experience of many decades as such. She is a wonderful person. She is editor in chief of uh, Journal of Anesthesiology and Clinical Pharmacology. She has uh, areas of interest: resuscitation, obstetrics, labor management, neurotrauma, care of elderly, acute pain management, education, and definitely she is wonderful in research and publications. Also, welcome, ma'am, and over to chairpersons. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Gar. Thank you so much. So, thank you, Rakesh. What an introduction, kind introduction. So, uh, so uh, this is uh, Dr. Shabri. Shabri, can we introduce this? Introduce? No, no, you, 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 okay. you introduce the uh, okay. speaker. So good evening. Uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ravinder Kumar Pandey. He is the professor in the Department of Anesthesiology, Pain Medicine and Critical Care. And he is uh, he has got uh, many publications, more than 280 publications mm -hmm. in various international and national journals. And he is editor in chief of International Journal of Perioperative Ultrasound and Applied Techniques. He is a life member of various international and national bodies, reviewer in various international and national journals. And his areas of interest are pediatric anesthesia, ICU, orthopedics. Ultrasound guided nerve blocks, difficult area management, transplant anesthesia, bariatric, and robotics. So, uh, uh, hand over to Dr. Pandey and Sarvedi uh, or Dr. Anju, please give the introduction on the topic. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a privilege to have Dr. Ravinda Pandey to talk about yet another important topic and yet another area there where anesthesiologists have actually marched in, giving anesthesia for IVF procedures, especially the oocyte pickup procedures. And I believe uh, major concerns hover around the fact that these procedures should not, uh, you know, kind of affect the future embryo. 
And uh, since uh, I believe, uh, so we'll have Dr. Pandey to talk to us about the potential for anesthetics to actually alter the um, outcome of these procedures. Over to you, Dr. Pandey. Yeah, good evening. So, good evening, everyone. Today, I'm going to discuss about anesthetic considerations of in vitro fertilization. As you all know, that in vitro fertilization is a well-established treatment for some cases of infertility, which is increasingly being practiced worldwide. So this is the IVF setup in my institute. So in my lecture, I'm going to discuss about four main topics related with in vitro fertilization, and they are anesthetic consideration, pain during IVF procedure, anesthetic agent use for in vitro fertilization, and anesthesia techniques for in vitro fertilization. Now to start with brief history, Step 2 and Edward in 1978 performed first successful live birth following in vitro fertilization of a human oocyte with the birth of Lucy Brown, the first test tube baby. Started first in late 1970s, in vitro fertilization is now a reasonable answer to infertility due to both maternal and paternal disorders. Gradually, the in vitro fertilization technology has evolved into more satisfied and advancement and better outcome. With time, technical advances have improved and more than 25 to 30 percent chances of pregnancy occurs after hormonal therapy. The role of anesthesiologist is very important as he or she may be involved in many aspects of the treatment and anesthesia techniques which may be complex and needs cautious perioperative management. As you know that in vitro fertilization is a four stage procedure which comprises of ovarian stimulation protocol to induce the development of multiple follicles. Second is ultrasound guided oocyte retrieval or transvaginal follicle aspiration. Third is fertilization in the laboratory and the fourth one is transfer of embryo back into the uterus. IVF procedures are performed as daycare cases. The basic principle of ambulatory anesthesia is used in these patients. Factors to be taken under anesthetic considerations are anesthetic techniques, pharmacological agent used for in vitro fertilization, length of exposure to these drugs. This is very important factor as the outcome of in vitro fertilization depends on it and pneumoperitoneum. The goal should be that all these procedures should not interfere with oocyte fertilization or early embryo development and implantation. So the transvaginal ultrasound guided oocyte retrieval, that is TUGAR, which is the gold standard technique for oocyte retrieval nowadays. It is most painful stage among in vitro fertilization procedures. The optimal anesthetic technique for in vitro fertilization should be safe and it should include effective analgesics with fewer side effects and a shorter recovery time and it is non-toxic to the oocytes. Oocyte retrieval was previously done laparoscopically but is now being done less invasively through vagina. Transvaginal approach for retrieval of oocyte is the most common approach adopted these days. It has following advantages. First, it is less stressful and painful. And second, there's less serum prolactin level during oocyte retrieval, which may affect in vitro fertilization outcome. There are other two important factors, and they are repeated exposure of anesthesia makes patient anxious, and this adequate pain relief is required for oocyte retrieval. There are some other coexisting illnesses which may affect the outcome of in vitro fertilization and they are the patient may be suffering from any medical or surgical disorders and patient may have known or anticipated diseases 
like tuberculosis and thyroid disorders. Patient may be on some medications which may affect the IVF outcome and they are anticoagulants, thyroid medications, antidepressant, anxiolytic and antitubercular drugs. And there are some special considerations which are also responsible for the primary infertility and they are when the patient is morbid obese, the patient is suffering from severe renal, cardiac and pulmonary diseases and in cancer patients also. In cancer patients, the oocyte retrieval usually being performed prior to chemo or radiotherapy. Now we are discussing the pain during IVF procedures. The oocyte retrieval is a fundamental step but most painful component of IVF procedure. The pain experienced during oocyte aspiration is caused by passage of needle through vaginal wall and by mechanical stimulation of the ovary. Although this is less invasive than laparoscopic procedure, the transvaginal oocyte retrieval still remains a painful procedure. The pain expressed during aspiration of oocyte is identical to intensive menstrual pain and the number of follicle and the duration of oocyte retrieval procedure may affect pain intensity. As we know that transvaginal retrieval of oocyte is a very painful procedure, so adequate pain relief is required for immobilizing a patient. Adequate pain relief eliminates the danger of piercing any vessel and there is easy oocyte retrieval also and patient is comfortable due to adequate pain relief and the patient is more cooperative. So, a favorable analgesic regime for oocyte retrieval must have no toxic effect on oocyte. It should have rapid onset and recovery and it should be easily administered and monitored. So, most frequently, opioids and benzodiazepines have been used for pain relief. Now I will discuss about different anesthetic agents and their effect on in vitro fertilization. Assessment of a specific anesthetic agent must be interpreted with its method of administration, its dose, its combination interaction with other drugs, its time of administration and its duration of exposure. It is very important. Pharmacological exposure to the anesthetic agent should be for the least possible duration with the minimal penetration to follicular fluid. Here I will discuss about various anesthetic agents and their effect on in vitro fertilization and its outcome. First and most important anesthetic agent is lignocaine which is well documented local anesthetic often used for paracervical block in pregnant women. 50 mg of lignocaine in follicular fluid does not negatively affect fertilization of human oocyte or early cleavage of human embryo. The second most important drug used for oocyte retrieval are opioids. The various opioids like fentanyl, L-fentanyl, remifentanyl have been safely used. Midazolam is the most commonly used benzodiazepine and uh, the minimal amount of it is found in follicular fluid, but no deleterious effect have been demonstrated. Coming to the ketamine, which is commonly used for sedation and analgesia. Now, the next two most important drugs are propofol and thiopentone. They are extensively used in IVF and their effect on fertilization, embryo cleavage and pregnancy rates have been assessed. There is no significant difference exists between the two in terms of fertilization, cleavage, embryo cell number, pregnancy, implantation and abortion rates. Propofol has added advantage of its antiemetic property and faster recovery. The concentration of propofol have been shown to increase in follicular fluid with time during oocyte retrieval, but there is no difference was found in the ratio of mature to immature oocytes. Coming to the etomidate, etomidate interferes with the endocrine functions of ovary. Hatins et al. found that there is a sharp decrease in plasma concentration of 
17 beta estradiol progesterone, 17 hydroxy progesterone, and testosterone. Nitrous oxide. It deactivates methionine synthetase and reducing the amount of thymidine available for DNA synthesis in dividing cells. The effect is minimal as inactivation of methionine proceeds slowly in the human liver and there is a low solubility of nitrous oxide exposes the oocyte to this gas for a shorter duration. Matt et al. have found deleterious effect of volatile halogenated fluorocarbons on IVF outcome. There is a higher incidence of post-operative nausea and vomiting following inhalation anesthesia used for in vitro fertilization as compared to TIVA. PONV is frequently related with peak levels of estradiol and previous history of PONV. Next is bromocryptane, which is a potent dopamine agonist. It inhibits anesthesia, induced hyperprolactinemia, and has a positive influence on embryonic development. Now, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Mylon et al. conducted a retrospective study and compared two analgesic protocols on IVF outcome. They found that both groups had similar IVF outcome, but nephopam and ketoprofen protocol enhanced patient comfort without jeopardizing the IVF success rate. Next, meditomidine is currently used for in vitro fertilization. It is centrally acting alpha-2 receptor agonist with both sedative and analgesic properties and it is devoid of any respiratory depressant effect. It is an effective baseline sedative, providing better patient satisfaction, less opioid requirement, and less respiratory depression than midazolam and fentanyl. However, its use may be limited by increased incidence of hypotension and bradycardia, and its limited ability to achieve deeper sedation when required. Here are some controversies regarding use of different anesthetic drugs on outcome of in vitro fertilization and they are effects of anesthetic drugs administered during transvaginal puncture for oocyte retrieval on conception rates. Anesthetic agents detected in follicular fluids may have adverse effect on oocyte fertilization and embryonic development. Prolonged exposure with general anesthesia lowers pregnancy and delivery rates. There are some controversies regarding pneumoperitoneum also. Pneumoperitoneum may have detrimental effect on oocyte quality and in combination of general anesthesia with nitrous oxide, influence fertilization and cleavage in vitro and it lowers the pregnancy rate. The other controversies are associated with halogenated agents. They are associated with reduced reproductive success in clinical practice. So they must be used with caution. Local anesthetic agents yield dissimilar pharmacokinetic profiles when administered via paracervical, epidural, and intrathecal techniques. Exposure to higher concentrations of different local anesthetics adversely affects fertilization and embryonic development. However, as oocytes are washed after retrieval, the clinical effect of using local anesthetic should be limited and probably no adverse effects occur. Now I am going to discuss about various anesthesia techniques used for in vitro fertilization. As you know that oocyte retrieval is usually performed transvaginally under ultrasound guidance. It is relatively brief outpatient procedure and it requires short acting anesthetic approach with minimal side effects. The various anesthetic modalities used for Tugor include monitored anesthesia care, conscious sedation, regional anesthesia, local injection as paracervical block, epidural analgesia, subarachnoid block, total intravenous analgesia, patient control analgesia, and acupuncture. Now, the first and most important method is monitored anesthesia care. It is relatively easy to deliver. The drugs are well tolerated and best suited in daycare settings. The optimal method should be individualized and selected on the basis of quality of sedation, analgesia, and their deleterious effects on reproductive outcomes. 
सेकेंड मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट एन एस सी आई टेक्निक यूज फॉर ऊसाइट रिट्रीवल इज कॉन्शियस सिडेशन यूज ऑफ कॉन्शियस सिडेशन एज ए मीन्स ऑफ पेन कंट्रोल एंड एंजियोलिस विद और विदाउट पैरा सर्वाइकल ब्लॉक रिड्यूसेस रिस्क एसोसिएटेड विद डीप सिडेशन और जनरल एनेस्थीजिया ड्यूरिंग ट्रांसफेजनल ऊसाइट रिट्रीवल कॉन्शियस सिडेशन अलोन में भी एसोसिएटेड विद हायर पोस्ट ऑपरेटिव साइड इफेक्ट सच एस नोशिया वॉमिटिंग dizziness and drowsiness although the best type of analgesia for oocyte retrieval has not yet been established the third technique is use of general anesthesia most of the anesthetic agent being used in general anesthesia have been found in the follicular fluid however in few studies it was observed that general anesthesia can be safer option for anesthesiologists as the uterus becomes more relaxed under general anesthesia and it is easier for the clinician to aspirate large number of ovarian follicles unlike sedation where a contracted myometrium may interfere with oocyte retrieval duration of general anesthesia should be kept minimum to avoid detrimental effects of these drugs on oocyte the pre ovarian block which is comparatively a newer technique in this block under ultrasound guidance local anesthetic is infiltrated in vaginal wall and between vaginal wall and peritoneal surface near the ovary the follicle aspiration needle is then inserted exactly in the same location where the local anesthetic has deposited cerner et al studies pre ovarian block versus para cervical block for two site retrieval and they concluded that both techniques provided comparable pain relief and both blocks in combination with iv alfentanil may be considered safe methods with rapid onset and recovery another most important anesthesia technique used for oocyte retrieval is para cervical block in this block the local anesthetic is injected into 2 to 6 sites at a depth of 3 to 7 mm alongside the vaginal portion of the cervix in the vaginal fortresses and in combination with different sedative pre medications with or without fast acting opiates it is acceptable technique for pain relief during oocyte aspiration there is a possible risk associated with para cervical block is potential toxicity of absorbed local anesthetics however in human there is no evidence of adverse events associated with lignocaine there is no adverse effect on fertilization cleavage or pregnancy rates by using para cervical block different doses of lignocaine like 50 100 200 used for para cervical block have no difference in pain relief levels during the oocyte retrieval and thus the lowest dose that is 50 mg has been recommended the other important anesthesia techniques used for oocyte retrieval are spinal and epidural anesthesia The spinal anesthesia is also an efficient method for oocyte retrieval. Intrathecal fentanyl in combination with lignocaine can improve the quality and prolong the duration of intraoperative analgesia. Epidural anesthesia is another mode of analgesia and it can be viable option in some conditions. It is most popular obstetric anesthetic technique. Neither it offers any obvious advantage over IV sedation. or other methods for oocyte retrieval nor it improves the treatment outcome coming to the another anesthesia technique that is total intravenous anesthesia with propofol and fentanyl it is superior to inhalational anesthesia with nitrous oxide and enflurane in view of less nausea and vomiting less requirement for antiemetic medications and lower possibility of unplanned admissions to the hospital now coming to another anesthesia technique that is patient control analgesia it is an alternative technique of analgesia the higher level of patient satisfaction as it allows them to control over their drug administration atacharya and et al compared effect of fentanyl administration either through pca pump or by physician the mean score in pca group was 38.5 versus 46.1 in non pca group and in pca group 64% of patient felt very satisfied with their analgesia 
compared with 57 in non-PCA group. A conclusion is, in terms of patient comfort and satisfaction, intraoperative PCA with fentanyl is an effective alternative to physician-administered technique. Now, lastly, I will discuss about acupuncture. It is a conventional therapy which activates the endogenous opioid system by increasing beta endorphin levels. It has additional benefit of providing antidepressant, anxiolytic, and sympathoinhibitory actions. It has been used along with various conscious sedation regimens and paracervical block to enhance analgesia during IVF procedures. It is an alternative for women desiring a non-pharmacological method for pain treatment. So just to conclude, the role of anesthetist in IVF is to provide adequate comfort and pain relief to the patients during two sites retrieval and embryo transfer procedures. Patient cooperation is also important and if the patient is comfortable, conscious sedation is a good option. In some cases, regional or general anesthesia may be requested. Different studies have explored the effect of anesthesia on IVF outcome but have yielded contradictory findings. These differences may be attributed in relation to differences in the study design and randomization, the anesthetic drug used or the anesthetic technique performed. Always pay attention to the comorbidities including those contributing to infertility and the drugs that the patient is taking. Furthermore, the anesthesia should be used for the shortest duration required. And these are the references. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ravinder, uh, for an elaborate talk on this uh, very important topic. Uh, I would invite my other co-chairpersons, Dr. Sarbiri and Dr. Jyotsna, to please uh, join in. And if there are queries, we can. Uh, I can't see anything in the chat box. Uh, I just want to know one thing that uh, he mentioned about uh, pre-ovarian block. Uh, I want to know it is given by the gynecologist or by the anesthesiologist. <laughs> Yeah, in, in our setup, it is ultrasound guided, given by a uh, gynecologist. So, um, any other question? Uh, what is the advantage of uh, giving PCA, using PCA pump over uh, spinal anesthesia? Uh, is it Actually, in our practice, I mean, uh, when the PCA, when the, P, the advantage of PCA is uh, not specific for IVF. It is uh, like in some other surgeries. The patient uh, herself control her uh, doses. And uh, like in a busy setup when the uh, nurses are not available and we uh, discuss uh, these te this technique with details with the patient and he uh, and she may, I mean, uh, use it uh, is, uh, confidently and comfortably. Okay. Uh, there are certain concerns as regard to ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome because many of these have multiple procedures yeah. and they do have yeah, issues. Yeah. So, are there so, specific? Yeah. Uh, we know? are. We have experienced uh, two, three cases in last two years, and uh, we have shifted the patient present with the like a full fledged pulmonary edema picture, and we admitted in our ICU, and uh, the uh, treatment is symptomatic. I mean, conservative kind of nothing is specific to the uh, this uh, with this uh, in vitro fertilization or oocyte retriever. Okay, and they do also have a lot of uh, high incidence of PONV. So, do you do use some specific uh, you know, techniques no, or do, precautions uh, for? No, PONV? no, we, we don't give we we use only onion citron six to eight mg. Okay. Don't give any like uh, a specific regime for these patients. Thank you so much. And propofol must be having additive effect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Generally, there's so many techniques are involved, but we generally use a combination of fentanyl, midazolam, and propofol. I think TY is one of the safest regimes yeah. to use, especially exactly. based on propofol. Exactly. Yeah. 
and we use sec uh, second second generation device also mm -hmm. uh, we give uh, uh, midazolam uh, 1 to 2 mg then fentanyl it is 1 to 2 mg uh, microgram per kg and then propofol 2 mg per kg and we uh, give uh, oxygen and isoflurane and uh, then uh, we see the when the jaw is relaxed we most of the patient in most of the patient we use supraglottic devices mm -hmm. so we give okay. uh, we use uh, second generation supraglottic devices and there are almost 6 um, to 10 patients per day so in aims the turnover is very high so the time is very short so although we are planning to give we have given uh, dexmedidine also in few patients but as in previous talks the recovery rate is very slow we can't wait for i mean the Only two three beds are in post op area. There you can watch the patient, and as soon as the patient is awake, then you can ship the patient in the ward. So uh, we are planning to increase the bed number, and we'll try definitely is dexmedidine and some other new drugs. So you always prefer uh, general anesthesia or tiba <coughs> rather than spinal anesthesia. In most of the yeah yeah we don't give regional because again regional anesthesia will take fifteen at least fifteen minutes. You just uh, paint and clean the area under aseptic precaution. Then you give a spinal and then you wait for the effect. So uh, the turnover is too high. So generally we prefer the uh, T bar. Okay. And patients Thank also you, go home uh, within Hello. few hours. Few so hours. Yeah, with yeah. regional anesthesia, the num number of hours uh, in the post-op period will be exactly, slightly prolonged. Exactly. Also, exactly, exactly. You should have wait. Uh, you should wait for next day because it is very risky to discharge the patient when she received a subarachnoid block or epidural block. So in all patients, we use uh, second generation LMA or isoflurane. Not, or, not in or, all. Not in all. in some patient we like uh, when there is a on it depends on the oocyte sometimes the gynecologist wants to retrieve only only two mature oocytes are there so the procedure is generally 15 to 20 minutes so when there are two oocyte there are, uh, sometimes we conduct the uh, this technique on um, on mask only we give okay. propofol we apnea we assist the uh, we assist the patient's uh, ventilation we can ventilate the patient maybe dr pandey they can be on spontaneous ventilation also yeah, uh, under effect of anesthesia intravenous anesthesia and uh, yes you are right at times they have to uh, cryo freeze the oocytes and there are 9 10 uh, oocytes which are uh, uh, well exactly, um, exactly. And they want to go for cryo preservation also so yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that may take some time but majority of the procedures can be done under uh, back mask ventilation uh, with patient on spontaneous or at the at the most spontaneous with assisted ventilation yes you write okay. 15 to 15 to 15 to 20 minutes procedures yeah 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 it depends on the number of oocytes the gynecologist wants to speed of the gynecologist and uh, everything goes uneventful yes yeah, yeah. dr pandey there is a, a question from varsha voda can you use fortwin she is asking no no we don't use fortwin generally we use uh, this fentanyl only fentanyl or sometimes uh, yeah fentanyl we generally use fentanyl in, uh, almost in all patients because this this is a short acting uh, opioid and these procedures are also very uh, i mean maximum they are one hour or we don't we don't give for for doing so there is uh, no concern of post procedure pain or anything for post procedure pain we generally give supplements or in boluses of fentanyl or we give paracetamol also perfalgan 1 gram perfalgan also yes we use multimodal analgesia technique for at uh, i mean for when you see uh, the practically the you can't give the uh, this whole soul opioid based technique for relieving the pain so we generally use uh, multimodal not pre uh, i mean sometimes uh, after induction when when the uh, procedure is about to finish we run the perfalgan one gram and we uh, we ship the patient in post op area and then we observe so we can uh, take the advantage of different opioid uh, or, or different analgesic techniques and uh, the because our goal is to discharge the patient as early as possible to ship the patient in in the ward And there are a few questions yeah. i think uh, yeah do you use muscle relaxants and someone else has asked do you use colin 
Uh, one is to put the LMA and the other is to restrict the respiratory abdominal movements. Um, I believe because most of the procedures are now transvaginal. Uh, you can take the question. So generally, we maintain that with the inhalational, uh, I mean the isoflurane we have seen and the literature also says that isoflurane and uh, propofol combination is very good. And uh, when we give incremental doses of, we can raise the MAC of uh, up to up to 1.5 with isoflurane and air and we can we can give uh, this propofol the boluses of propofol that is 0.25 to uh, 0.5 milligram mm -hmm. per kg and we do not need succinyl choline for putting an lma uh, you know most of the times i think no, a, a no, we don't, a propofol we don't does need. the trick for us and you know it does do well yeah no, I, fentanyl I, I, mean, I yeah. If fentanyl uh, is not available, then which opioids do you suggest? Uh, actually, I'm working in that setup. There's no problem, but uh, I would suggest that uh, you can use pentazosine or butyrphenol. Mm -hmm. But then you must monitor your patients in the post-op period. Dr. Anjou is absolutely right. There are two sets. And one, I, one, one uh, where there is no fentanyl available or. Uh, uh, there is some uh, uh, sir, uh, uh, yes most welcome sir so that's the question which uh, somebody has written that fort win uh, they've been using it for day in and day out so mm -hmm. those those anesthesiologists who had uh, experience of using fort win phenargan during those early days they are very comfortable with that so as we have been taught and sir will also endorse choose the technique with which you are most comfortable with so i think uh, dr anju yeah. you and me will and dr pandey will be more comfortable with propofol midazolam and fentanyl and somebody will be more uh, comfortable with fortwin and phenargan and butyrphenol dr paul sir please during my I residency been... days sorry during my residency days i had uh, used uh, this fortwin but for last 20 22 years i had, i have not used so um, i'm not so... comfortable with fortwin yeah so uh, uh, I am I am uh, muting everybody with an option of unmuting yourself. So you can unmute yourself and uh, express. Dr. Call, sir, please unmute yourself. Yes. Please, sir. Can I, can I go ahead? Go ahead, sir, please. I have an experience of doing about 20 cases twice a month. These oocyte retrieval. 20 to 30 okay. cases in one sting. Okay. And we use absolutely minimum, no regional blocks, no subarachnoid block, no epidural, no cervical block. Just, I use three drugs, midazolam, ketamine, and propofol. And the procedure never lasts, never lasts more than 10 to 15 minutes. And within an hour of, I first give, one to two milligram midazolam, followed by ketamine about 20 milligrams, and then propofol one milligram per kg. Spontaneous respiration with air, with oxygen enrichment and procedures. I have been doing it for the last almost 10 years. Thank God without any problem and very happy and successful and successful. These are simple, simple procedures because if you give a regional block, then the Admission, yeah. you have to admit the patient. These patients need to go. They have to, they are daycare patients. Yeah. It's a daycare. Be yeah. alert. And, and in the OT, in one single OT, I have three tables, which can be, they are the trolleys basically, where <laughs> this, okay. the trolleys can be shifted. The procedure is performed on the trolleys and then you can shift the patient. Just one, two and three in a circle, it moves. And you, otherwise you, you waste a lot of time on bringing the patient in, shifting it out. I do 20 to 30 patients in not more than three hours. Not more than three hours. Thank how, you. how do you make a lithotomy on a trolley, sir? There are, uh, no, the trolleys have been made such, which can be where the head and can be raised and lowered. There is a position for the lithotomy also. You can put it there. They are detachable. You can right. detach them and put the... Uh, put rest. Okay, got it, sir. So, similarly, there's a similarly there's a grill on the right as well as the left side so that the patient doesn't fall. Got it. It sir. is a it is a treat to watch it. Very simple, cheap, and affordable, affordable and safe procedure. 
Right, sir. May? I? Yes, Dr. Sunil Sethi, please. Sir, good evening, everybody. Your video is off. Sorry. Yes, sir. Sir. Uh, I'm lucky to work with Dr. Rakhi, and we have worked so many uh, cases with TIVA and uh, in relational agent. In private practice, this matters. <coughs> the only thing, sir, as uh, Dr. Kol was saying, that regional blocks hinders the discharge, so we depend on TIVA basically. So TIVA is a very good uh method of doing uh, these cases and especially uh, one question was there fortune finagan some people are using fortune finagan but i will tell you i have used thousands of fortune finagan if you give it half an hour before the procedure it is very helpful if you think you are giving 3 minutes before the procedure it won't help and uh, regarding uh, propofol ketamine and uh, mset isoflurane these four things are sufficient for doing a procedure and i have done sufficient procedures no problem you can discharge the patient after 3 hours of the surgery absolutely right Dr. thank you dr sethi for your input because he is an anesthetist to my wife and uh, <laughs> conduct, conduct, conducting ivf proce procedures regularly so thank you for your inputs thank you dr sethi over to chairpersons i think uh, it's uh, 925 so i we can have concluding but, remarks from the chairpersons and the dr sethi no sorry, dr sharma sir, sir, sir i will need one minute for uh, conclude go ahead sir the topics which were discussed were very interesting because of my uh, some emergencies i couldn't attend i want to have a question with dr sangeeta khanna if she is online i know no she has left she has already I left. Is okay. left i will seek the opinion of the uh, house every senior person is there i have uh, done endoscopic procedures under propofol the only problem is when you land up in bleeding lower esophageal end then you have to be very cautious you you have a patient who is semi prone although we can use supraglottic devices but these patients are very uh, demanding right bleeding bleeding esophageal varices patients must Sir. be intubated you must maintain uh, secure the airway with an endotracheal tube because you cannot predict that how much time the procedure is going to take whether Definitely. it is just 3 minutes 4 minutes or half an hour so this problem i had a problem in this case when i was moving to amritsar i so left the why, patient that is why i am telling you the best thing is bleeding bleeding very still bleeding very you see i as a as a practicing anesthetist these days we do lot of these day care procedures whether it is endoscopy or egg retrieval or any other such procedures what has been discussed today but for bleeding varices in my opinion we must intubate the patient you can never be sure how much time it is going to sir uh, if if you are practicing nowadays what are the charges have... being paid hmm what are the charges being paid charges better to keep it confidential <laughs> sir sir seriously if you have a bleeding varices patient you hmm. cannot charge 2000 3000 nahi i i charge minimum 2500 for endoscopy minimum 2500 done all said and done sir please i am not crossing my lakshman rekha mm -hmm. sir you are my guru but the thing is endoscopic uh, ya yeah, jo uh, the gastroenterologist they have a package of around for esophageal bedding they charge 20 20000 and they pay you 20 uh, 200 uh, sorry 2000 or 2500 maximum but i had a patient who 
took three hours for this procedure. Charge them hourly. So for aggregate trivial, for aggregate trivial, the the sir, charges are very very less less because sir, it is the bulk. I, you do I, about I, twenty I, cases. I, I, sir, I worked with Doctor Rakhi. We did ten cases, starting four thirty, finishing six thirty. I took twenty thousand from Namin. <laughs> that is good. <laughs> That was my luckiest. Sir, I, I I can tell you rates in Rohtak are fixed from my wife's nursing home only, and if they say if the anesthetist husband uh, can fix the uh, can allow our wife to his wife to pay, so the the rates are set from that particular nursing home only, sir. And our city is the regular. We should nursing. marry. We should marry all surgeons to the anesthetist. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll. It's already 9:25, and thank you for a fruitful discussion. I hand over it to the, the chairpersons uh, for you. their concluding remarks, so that I can invite uh, formally few other speakers. Dr. Anju Grewal, Dr. Tharvi Swaika, and Dr. Dosna Goswami. Thank you very much uh, from our trip side. Uh, over to you, Dr. Dosna, please. Yes, it was a nice uh, pro program for all together. All the speakers were very good, and I think Dr. Anju, any more question? No more question for this session, right? I think, and Dr. Yeah, Anju has answered actually quite a lot of questions. I can see that. I so, tried to answer a few of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There was an uh, issue about nitrous oxide. Uh, yeah. It's, it's not used, madam. You are answering it very well. Better lovely. avoid it. Better <laughs> avoid it. Better Just avoid it. Yeah, better to yeah. avoid because. Because the role of nitro ox nitrous oxide is still controversial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So theoretically, it causes uh, it hampers the cleavage, it hampers the fertilization, and uh, it affects on embryo also. So better not to use. In IVF only liquid. In IVF only liquid nitrogen, sir. Only liquid nitrogen. <laughs> yes, sir. Got a call, sir. Thank you. Thank you. It is enough. It is all the Dr. Naveen. Tomorrow is Karwa Chauth. It is all the nine thirty. Sir, you are in a problem. You are in a problem. My three chair chairpersons are females and they are asking questions. So I know the opposite. <laughs> <part too. laughs> so I think they had already <laughs> applied Mendi and uh, uh, their husbands are as cooperative as I am. <laughs> uh, thank okay, ma'am. Right. Uh, thank, thank you very much. So I'll. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh Karg, for beautiful I'll, I'll, patience we have throughout the this evening. Yes. Thank you, it's madam. And now I invite uh, uh, Dr. S. P. Sharma sir, and uh, to say a few words. Dr. S. P. Sharma sir. Yeah, actually, uh, so nice to see all, and uh, it's a really very very excellent webinar. And uh, I really congratulate to Dr. Rakesh Karg and Dr. Naveen and all participants. Basically, this. Uh, webinar was uh, fully uh, you can say that uh, making a very important issue basically i say that the theme of this uh, non operating room anesthesia is basically a very important part of anesthesia division which i see there is a great future in that and they have included very important topics and not only that they have included the pediatric part also so basically this is a excellent webinar and and uh, there was a lot of interaction also so it was very interactive uh, session and in last what I, what i was seeing that beside the academic in, uh, interaction there was interaction of financial also that was very very interesting because there is also Baba, important part. there is also important part and, uh, i, I congratulate uh, all speakers and thank you to all speakers all chairpersons all our executive members of the society and all participants and uh, with their cooperation the webinar is going well and uh, we will continue it uh, thank you very much thank you sir for your uh, kind words uh, quick words from dr chandrakant patel uh, ex gc member of rssgp and dr mayank masan sir good evening sir good evening sir respected respected senior colleagues and my dear friends sir First of all, a very happy Karwa Chauth in advance to everybody, and uh, it's a very pretty coincidence that we are discussing anesthesia for non-operating room environments because this is the kind of anesthesia 
that most of the anesthetists administered in the COVID times. They were subjected to this. Thank you so much for bringing this subject. And it was a very well-planned meeting and a very interactive meeting. And the speakers and all the chairpersons, congratulations. And thank you so much for giving us this legitimate knowledge. Thank, thank you, you so much. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Mian. Long live RSAC, please. Sir. Thank you, Mian. Thank you very much. Chandrakant? Okay. So, uh, uh, with this, uh, we... Namaste, sir. Oh, yeah, please, Chandrakant. Yes. Uh, uh, sir, I'm listening, sir. This is an area of uh, my own interest, sir. Thank you, all the uh, respected teachers, chairpersons, Dr. Naveen, Dr. Rakesh, for this uh, very important uh, uh, theme which we have uh, brought uh, today. Very important, sir. And mostly uh, at railway setup also, we practice this type of anesthesia, though within the hospital only, sir. And what it was very useful, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Naveen, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chandrakan. Uh, with this, uh, uh, we come to the conclusion of today's webinar. I congratulate RSSAP Delhi branch and the GC members from Delhi, Dr. Rakesh Gar, Dr. Colonel uh, Raki Goel, and uh, Major General Navdeep Sethi, sir. Happy uh, Karvachoth to all of you. And I think we, I was right in, uh, we were discussing with Rakesh, so we pre-poned this uh, uh, webinar from Wednesday to Tuesday. Because if it would have been Wednesday 9.30, <laughs> we would have all been in, in soup. So thank you very much. And we will see you uh, after two weeks on uh, 18th of November and uh, uh, Wednesday for the next webinar, which will be hosted by RSSP Mumbai branch. Uh, Dr. Indrani Himant Kumar uh, and other GC members will host that uh, webinar. It's on 18th Wednesday. Thank you very much. Uh, long live ISA. Okay. Have a nice uh, festival. Good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you very much. Good night, thank, you. Long live thank you so much. And thank you all the RSSP dignitaries, esteemed chairperson and speakers for active participation. I think everybody is here till 9.30. And thank you all the participants who has given uh, a lot of interaction and good uh, comments uh, in this. I think more than 200 people have joined it. So thank you so much. And thanks once again. Long live RSSC. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Rakesh. You, Dr. Rakesh. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. Long live RSSC. Thank, thank you, Rakesh. Thank you, Rakesh. Thank you, Rakesh. Thank you, Rakesh. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Rakesh. Thank you so thank much. You. And it's a pleasure to see you, Dr. Anjokra, while sitting all through. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> great, thank great, you. great.